Walter Jones, Pro Football Hall of Famer, Top 100. Tyler Liger from the Seattle Seahawks. DK Metcalf. Today, Burleson, you're watching North NorCam. NorCam. You're watching North Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Norvcap coming at you. Uh, then the week following what was a very interesting and exciting uh, draft weekend, not to mention there have been some moves, as I said in the title here, DJ Fluker, Justin Britt were released, and it kind of made some sense, some of the moves that Seattle did in their draft after we saw those moves happen. There was already some rumblings that possibly one or both of those guys might go, but that was confirmed pretty much as soon as the draft was over. And that maybe tells a little bit of a story of maybe what the Seahawks have planned coming up Uh with the release of those guys and what that freed up salary might mean. So I want to just do that and talk about all the different uh, things that are going on uh, with the Seahawks right now and, and kind of get a look back and a grade of what uh, the draft was like. And I want to turn to a couple of my buddies who are always a regular part of this show, um, Calvin Domingo and Noah Bolter, uh, my friends from KGRG Radio, uh, and also doing their own thing on YouTube and on podcasting as well. So, Calvin, Noah, welcome back. How you guys doing? Doing good as always. Uh, always a pleasure to be on. Thank you, Norv. Pretty good, Norv. You know, you, you're always doing this for us, and we're so thankful for you. I wanted to offer you a gift for the one time. I like to call it a social distance rose. No <laughs> This is for you. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> well, thanks. I'll uh, I'll di- digitally re- uh, reach for it and uh, and accept your accept this rose. I feel like I'm on The Bachelor or something, but uh, <laughs> I'll take this rose. <laughs> oh, this is uh, this that's good. I did not see that one coming. That's my surprise gift of the day. Um, I normally have got the chat going on here, but there seems to be some issue. Uh, with the chat. Let me see if I can, uh, while we're talking, get this uh, working here. Okay, I think we got it, but I need to get some uh, little stuff going on here uh, technically. But let's, let's just start with the talk about the uh, the draft. Um, just give you some quick thoughts about how things went, you know, your overall, uh, you know, uh, just impressions of it and whether we got better you know, just uh, let's start with you, Calvin. Just give me some, a, a kind of a big picture view on what you thought of the draft this this season, this year. So I think overall, if I had to give us a grade, I would give us a B minus. Um, and to answer your question about did we get better, most definitely. I think every every team that leaves the draft, you know, you come out thinking that you're better. And so obviously we won't know until, you know, uh, play begins. But I think for the most part, we filled a good amount of our needs. Uh, I was a little confused as to why we didn't draft anybody at all in the secondary. We waited until um, the undra- we waited to sign, you know, undrafted free agents. Uh, we signed a few cornerbacks, you know, a few safeties there. But I was a little surprised as to why you know we didn't address that need in the draft. Um, but I think for the most part, you know, I like what we did. Um, we drafted, you know, a whole lot of athletes um, and a whole lot of, you know, just solid, real good football players. I can't wait to, to see them perform this upcoming season. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with Calvin, yes, even on the grade. Like, we, we gave him the same grade. Yeah. Uh, I, I like a lot of the pieces that we brought in. My biggest problem and the reason why I, I did give him a B minus instead of a higher grade. I agree with Calvin. We should have addressed the secondary, especially when we had guys like Christian Fulton falling so right. far out of LSU and Cam Dancer out of Mississippi State. Uh, Cam Dancer is one of those guys. He's not as big, but he's a great open field tackler. That's a guy I had targeted on my board. And we let him fall pretty far in the draft. And uh, the other reason why I marked down our, dra- our, our graft- draft grade was because of the fact that uh, – we drafted guys a little bit too early. Jordan Brooks, Darrell Taylor, those were two guys like we were talking about. We could have drafted both in the first round, but we also could have got both a little bit later. If we trade back a little right. bit, as Seattle loves to do, we could have uh, gotten more picks and potentially used them on our secondary, but we were unable to do so. I, I read some reports about trades that fell through. The Packers were trying to trade up for Jordan Love. We could have added some more pieces, assets, equity down the line. We were unable to do so, but all in all, we did bring in a good amount of talent and it is going to help us uh, in the near future as well as the the far future. 
Who was your favorite pick of the draft, and uh, who was your worst? I, I will, I'll, I'll, before I get into that, so I was kind of the same. I think I was a B minus as well, but I bumped it up to a B because the more I started to look a little bit more closely at some of the guys, I started to think, you know, I, I allow myself to look beyond my initial, what the heck are they doing? Why did they choose this person now? And started thinking, okay, down the road, this could really pay off some, some pay some dividends. But uh, before I get into you know my favorites and least favorites, uh, Calvin, tell me about which of the standouts. Which was your favorite pick? Which was your your uh, least favorite? So I think my favorite pick is going to be guard Damian Lewis from LSU, just because he brings everything that we look for in an offensive lineman. Um, he brings a lot of power, especially in the run game, and he brings a lot of a lot of passion. You know, he was talking about how he wanted to play for us, and you know, you want guys that want to play for us. You know, same with Javon Kinlaw of the Niners. He said he wanted to play for the Niners because of the culture that they have, and, and there you go, he's playing for the Niners. And same thing with Lewis. Uh, he's a mauler in the run game. Obviously, we're a run-based team, and so he's the perfect prospect. And uh, with all due respect to, to DJ Fluker, I mean, we needed to save some money. And so with the with the drafting of Damian Lewis, that essentially, you know, showed DJ Fluker the door, which obviously we saw with his release a couple of days ago. And, um, yeah, I just I really like what he brings to the table. He played for, you know, obviously for, for the national champions and, and the LSU Tigers. And so he has that pedigree. And, um, yeah, so I, I love the Damian Lewis pick. As far as, uh, um, what's it called? When it comes to picking, like, I guess my least favorite pick, I don't know. I think it comes down to, to either either DJ Dallas or Steven Sullivan. Um, if I have to pick, I'd say DJ Dallas just because um, – actually, not, no reason in particular, just – he was a running back that I didn't necessarily like. I thought there, I thought that there were other running backs that we could have gotten. Um, he he's a little raw because he did go into to college. He started off as a wide receiver, and then coming out of high school, he played quarterback. And so I just feel like if we were gonna go running back, we should have chosen. We should have picked a guy who was a little bit more polished. I, I feel that. I mean, I do feel that you know we're able to to develop him into into the type of running back that you know eventually could shine for us, but I think that we could have gone a different direction. There were other running backs that I liked, but yeah, I, I, I'd have to say DJ Dallas, but that's just that's just nitpicking because I didn't really dislike any of our picks, and so I'll just have to go with DJ Dallas. Calvin, I'm really glad you said DJ Dallas because we finally disagree about something. My least favorite <laughs> that we picked, uh, it was the other guy that you brought up, Stephen Sullivan. Part of the reason that I disliked the pick was because going into the draft, wide receiver wasn't a huge need. We also already addressed wide receiver. Because remember, Stephen Sullivan out of LSU also played tight end. We already drafted a tight end and brought in tight ends this offseason. Uh, mm -hmm. as well as the one that we got coming back healthy. Well, this league, tight end is not necessarily a spot of major need for us. And then we drafted Kobe Parkinson and then uh, Stephen Sullivan, who, who who plays tight end and wide receiver. What I do like about Sullivan is his ability to scramble and to, and to keep plays alive. That's one of the trends that I noticed about Seattle in this draft is we got a lot of guys who are good at uh, improvising when the play breaks down. And that's what I saw from Stephen Sullivan. He had a down year last year. He never had a crazy good uh college year and I, I would have preferred that we use that pick on someone in the secondary uh kind of on the same page with calvin also on the same page with calvin my favorite pick was damian lewis look this guy is a physical uh run blocking uh, he loves to run block he loves to play physical he gets his hand and helps his uh center and tackle to either side of him and then works his way up to the second level of the defense extremely well he has great vision uh he pancakes individuals he plays physical he knocks them on their butt and he loves to do it i think it's a great fit for seattle system it allowed us to uh, free cap space up as you guys talked about so definitely my favorite pick damian lewis least favorite Stephen sullivan and uh so your point real quick my, my bad more. no go ahead about sullivan I think the fact that we also traded a draft pick in next year's draft just to get him, because we didn't have that seventh round pick to pick him up. I think that that kind of played into into me disliking that pick a little bit. Although I do like the the tools that he brings to the table. You know, uh, he can play wide receiver, tight end. He's huge, and he's raw. 
he definitely needs a lot of refinement in his game, but I think he's he's purely a, a developmental guy. So. Yeah, well, uh, and for those of you who are just joining us, uh, I want to make sure you guys know who's who are my guests here, Calvin Domingo and Noah Bolter. You see their uh, their handles there, at Steezy Way and at DJ Squabo. These guys are both uh, uh, sports analysts, I like to call you guys that, uh, on radio and on YouTube. Uh, they both uh, broadcast out of KGRG Radio, uh, the local college here, and they also have their own YouTube channels and um, the your show, The Bolt. Right, uh, Noah, that you do your uh, your your own analysis on sports on. So check the check their description links in uh, the description. Uh, so it's always a pleasure to have these guys on. They offer a a, a lot of great perspective uh, besides uh, what I bring here. So my my take on the draft, um, I'd say I'll start with my worst choice, and I would probably go to the first choice of the Seahawks. And I'm not knocking the player because I think he is a. I think I, 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 he better deliver because of what we, you know, picked him at and everything. I just felt like that was the one position I was so surprised that we would address linebacker that early in the in the draft. So I think I was just probably the most disappointed at the time when that pick was made, just because we talked about, like you said, we need so much secondary help. Uh, defensive tackle never got addressed uh, during the draft, and I felt like there's a lot more need there, at least immediate need, than uh, I felt at, at the linebacker spot. So I'm, I'm hoping that he'll prove me wrong, but I would have to probably say that was probably my most disappointing pick uh, uh, of the draft. My favorite pick wasn't at the time, but the more I've looked at it is uh, the aforementioned Colby Parkinson. Um, first, I was shocked in an already crowded tight end group, but the more I looked at his Physical traits, his description. Now, of course, I don't watch these guys, so I am no expert on how good they are game in, game out. I can only read what the you know, what the tape tells us and kind of how he's described. But if he is as described, the thought of him, you know, Greg Olson, we hope will contribute and stay healthy. We also hope that Will Disley will stay healthy. But if this guy is the number three guy to come in here, to me, he looks sort of like a, um, uh, a Jimmy Graham that can block, you know, and, uh, and and can fight for the ball. So if if he is that sort of player, the thought of having dual tight ends down the line, eventually Will Disley, if he can get onto a stretch of being healthy, and uh, 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 Colby Parkinson side by side, not only from the passing standpoint, but you know, so much about how our offense has been dictated formation wise was because we were reduced to one tight end and you know we had a lot of great plays out of our Jacob Hollister but he's no one's number one tight end on anybody's list right you're lucky to put him at number three on your depth chart behind probably two other ones who are better than him. he was probably I think number three and eventually became number one by def- by default but that forced us to bring in you know a sixth lineman whose only job was to block but Essentially, if we get to that point where we can have two tight ends who can both block, who can both also go out and and catch the ball, uh, we would be so much more dynamic of an offense. And then you don't just have that guy who's the sixth player who's just there to you know be a body to to move some people. We get some, we can do some play action and double tight end sets. The run blocking will be there. So I just feel like the tight end. You know, this is more or less immediate, but down the line, I get excited when I start thinking about what Colby Parkinson can do. So that would be my, my I guess my surprising over time became one of my favorite picks of the draft. And then uh, as a side note, I was like you, I was like, what, another tight end in the seventh round and we traded to get him? I, I'd actually signed off my coverage thinking we're done. <laughs> we're Seahawks are done. I'm, I'm going to go do some other things since I've been broadcasting for an hour. And then all of a sudden I see this thing saying Seahawks drafted tight end. I was like, wait, we didn't have any picks. Where'd this come from? And all of a sudden, you know, I was like, this made no sense. But I don't know if you have you guys heard the phone call of uh, John Schneider talking to him uh, when he got drafted. It, it's it's I, I I wish I'd prepped it up here. Well, actually, I kind of have it here. Maybe I could play it for you. Um, but all right, let me play this. Just listen to this if you can hear this. Hello, Stefan. Yes, sir. Hey, it's John Schneider with the Seattle Seahawks, man. How you doing? Good. We're getting ready to select you right here, bud. Man, coach, don't play with me, coach. <laughs> no, I am. I'm a GM coach, for the Hawks. Coach. You're gonna come, come be with the Hawks, okay? Don't play with me, coach. Go ahead, coach, man. Don't play with me, coach. Coach, coach, don't do it to me, coach. Please, please don't play with me, coach. What's that? You playing? No, we're selecting you right here, buddy. Turn it yeah. in. Man. Turn it in, Matt. <laughs> we got you, dog. You're coming. You're coming to Seattle. <laughs> yeah, buddy. 
So I heard that, and I've, I've listened to a lot of these things. And DK Metcalf's last year was pretty powerful. He was crying, like, "What took you so long?" And you love that stuff, man, because it really reveals the hearts of these guys. Because some guys call like, "Hey, so how do you feel? You're gonna be a Seahawk? Great! Oh, I'm excited. Thank you." I'm like, "That's it? Come on, man! It's like you're. This is supposed to be the day that this is changing your life right here." And this guy sounds like a guy whose life has changed. And and obviously, seventh rounder, he was probably starting to think. It's not going to happen. I'm going to be undrafted. I don't know if anyone's going to give me a chance. And he gets this call at the last second to be, you know, just to sneak into the draft. And that's why he doesn't believe it. He's like, are you messing with me? And I, I just loved hearing that that enthusiasm in his voice about, you know, that he can't believe this is happening. And let's get to work, you know. And you just got to love that enthusiasm from a guy who you feel like he's going to come in here and he's going to he's going to work because he's he's. He's not going to be a guy who takes this for granted. So I'm hoping he will prove you guys wrong and be a dude who can really, uh, you know, be a standout and, 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 and make good on his reaction there so that we'll all think about this day that we heard his voice on the phone and go, wow. Remember that day we all thought, what the heck have we dra- drafted this dude for? Well, there we go. Now look at him now. Look at that the all-star. You know, Hall of Famer. Look at him. No, but you know what I'm saying? So you, you, want, you want those guys to do well because you feel like they really – really um, deserve the chance and you want something good to come out of that so uh, anyway so that's that was that became my sort of honorable mention favorite pick just because of that phone call right there uh, so anyway those are feel good stories um, so I know we had we have there hasn't been a lot of talk uh, about undrafted guys and I have to be honest we have not really jumped much into the research so I'm going to turn to you guys because you are my experts you guys know much more than someone like myself uh, about a lot of these guys so I'd like to find out what you guys think of our the undrafted free agents that we snag do you guys have any thoughts as to um, anyone who stands out that you're excited that we got Did we, is there a future Doug Baldwin in here or, or some you know other type of uh, player who's no named right now but could be that guy who comes out and surprises everybody uh, Calvin, I'll th- I'll throw it to you first. What do you think? Um, one of the guys that stands out to me is quarterback Anthony Gordon from from Wazoo, just because I thought that we would address backup quarterback some you know somewhere late in the draft. Um, I did think he was going to get drafted. You know, I saw a lot of projections of him going to let's say the sixth, maybe the seventh round. So I was kind of surprised to to see him not drafted. Um, but to answer your question, uh, is there like a Doug Baldwin type of guy? Honestly, that's really hard to say. Um, but the one guy that does stand out is Anthony Gordon because he does one, he feels a need. Um, he showcased a lot of potential at Wazoo. Uh, he did come from a spread offense, and so a lot of t- a lot of the times when when a quarterback is playing, you know, on the uh, with the spread offense, you you wonder if that translates to the NFL level. I think that he was able to answer some questions about that, about whether or not he was able to, you know whether his games able to translate. Um, so I'm not worried too much about that. Um, I do think that he'll be a, a great backup quarterback. Now we won't have to, you know, sign anybody else. And he definitely feels good. Calvin, you got like a, a hidden camera in here. You're like looking at everything I'm about to say because I'm with you. I think I think Gordon's going to be the biggest guy just because a, a lot of the guys that are coming in, even Gordon, like they're not going to play a very big role unless everything hits the fan, which obviously we don't want to happen. I, I'm, I'm not trying to rule these guys out, but nobody really stood out to me as an unrestricted free agent. It was nice to add some pieces to the secondary, mm. uh, but they're really going to have to earn it uh, through training camp and through uh, all the hard work that they're able to put in, especially with the shortened off season the way that it is, and we don't know what the regulations are going to be down the stretch here. Uh, it's going to be really hard for them to make the team. So I think this year, unrestricted, uh, unrestricted free agents, unfortunately, might be a wash. Well, one of my, the guys I'm I'm kind of excited just because I don't watch a lot of college football, but I do watch the Huskies as I, I'm an alum of the UW. So when they got Aaron Fuller, wide receiver from the Huskies, I thought, okay, there's a there's a guy, you know, he, you know, I wouldn't say he's in the Doug Baldwin category yet, but you know, he's a guy who I think probably will make an impact on special teams, and uh, you never know. Uh, 
they could do something. You know, I mean, you, you think about the guys, um, you know, those, those guys like Chris Carson, who, you know, he, he wasn't undrafted, but he was a seventh rounder. And now he's like the number one back, you know, in our, in our backfield, uh, barring uh, his injury status. But I don't think anybody really saw that possibly come in. Although when I did my draft music video, I did say that this guy is ready to compete with the very elite. And sure enough, he ended up being number one in our depth chart. So I don't think anyone gave him really a shot. So who's to say that uh, uh, an Aaron Fuller couldn't come out and make an impact? And, you know, football's a funny game. You know, guys get hurt. Things move around, and next thing you know, you're next man up, and, and, and you might be making plays. So I'm, I'm hoping that this guy can at least uh, make a name for himself in special teams and maybe work his way up like a David Moore. David Moore was also uh, one of those late-round draft pick guys who, you know, has continued to stay out with the Hawks and have an impact. So you never know. You never know. We could be uh, – well, some of these names might pop out, uh, you know, down the line a, a year or two from now. Okay, so uh, we'd love to see that. So let's talk about um, the release of Fluker was announced first, and then uh, the other shoe dropped, and then uh, Justin Britt. Uh, really no surprise from a salary standpoint. I think they ended up saving over $12 million, uh, in cap space by, by those moves. Uh, what do you guys think? What does that mean? Is this telling us something about what their next move might be? Is this a hint towards the free agency side? And maybe these, we've been throwing these names about Ngakwe and Griffin and uh, Clowney. I think despite the fact that Jaron Reed just got the number 90 back and that was the number that Clowney wore, is that telling things? Or is this all still one big poker game that everybody's still got their chips and holding the cards close to the vest? Uh, no, I'll shift things around a little bit. No, I'll Tell me what your thoughts on when you heard about the news. What did you? What do you think this means for the Seahawks moving forward? So uh, there, there's really three pieces of news we're breaking down right now, right? So the DJ Fluker and Justin Britt, we can pair those together. Uh, Seattle's supposed to save about 12.2 million in cap space based on those cuts, uh, and what that does is it allows room for us to keep talking to Jadavion Clowney, but. With the Jerron Reed news about getting his old number back in number 90, that does not look good for Seattle. I don't believe Jadavion Clowney is coming back. I think we're looking at other pieces potentially that we could add. And I have a suggestion here. Because of the fact that we have done so through free agency and through the draft, we have been so heavy on defensive line, defensive end. we got Alton Robinson, uh, Darrell Taylor, Bruce Irvin, uh, Benson Mayo, and all these guys. I still think we go Everson Griffin, but we can get him for a cheap price tag, about $6 million. Mm -hmm. The other player that I think that we could still sign, who I talked about months before free agency, and somehow he is still a free agent. Rumors coming out that he was talking to the Jets a couple weeks ago. He led the Tennessee Titans in tackles last year. He had four sacks and he had four interceptions. What if we were to go after a guy like Logan Ryan with this extra money we just saved? His salary cap hit would be about $9, $10 million. We just freed up 12. Logan Ryan could come in and instantly play a huge role for Seattle. I haven't heard it rumored anywhere, but because of how Seattle is focused so heavy on defensive end and edge rusher linebacker through the draft and through free agency to this point i'd say after this uh unless we get an agakwe uh via trade which still has the potential of happening especially with how the leverage thing is working out there with jacksonville uh not getting any offers that they like uh and with how they were able to draft with edge rusher and clavon chase on uh, I could see Seattle making that trade, but I think if we're talking free agents and because we can't guarantee that Jacksonville is going to take a deal regardless of what we offer them, uh, I say free agents. I look at Logan Ryan as a guy. How is he still available? How is he still not taken? 113 tackles last year, four and a half sacks, four interceptions. What if we added him to our secondary? For a cornerback, too. That's the mm -hmm. whole lot of production. Yeah. How about you, Calvin? Is there a guy out there that uh, you're thinking could be lurking in the in the in the tall grass there that the Seahawks could surprise all of us on? Oh, most definitely. Um, I don't think that we're gonna release these guys unless we had a, a plan in mind. Because keep in mind, last year after the draft, we didn't. I mean, so last year around the time of the draft, we didn't have Anza yet. We didn't have Clowney yet. We made those moves after the draft. And so this year, I have a feeling that, you know, Pete Carroll and Josh Schneider, they have something up their sleeve. 
Um, and Noah brings up a whole lot of great points. Logan Ryan, uh, he, I'm surprised he's still on the board, too. I've just been hearing that the only reason why he's still a free agent is because he's been asking for too much money. But, I mean, you, you, brought, it, you brought it up earlier. Uh, we freed up about $12 million in cap space. And so if he's asking for around 9 to $10 million, we can give him that 9 to $10 million. Um, Everson Griffin's also a target. I think my my guy, uh, my preference would be Yannick Ngakwe. Just because uh, we definitely have the money to sign him. And I think that with San Fran trading for a stud left tackle and, and Trent Williams, I think we should look at that. And, and we got to be like, look, we got to match. We got to match that. You know, we got to bring in uh, a big name as well. And Yannick Ngakwe, he brings so much to the table. Obviously, you know, pass rush. But he's young. He's only 25. And so he's definitely, uh, I could see him being a, a part of the long-term plan for us. I think Yannick Ngakwe would be my number one option. Everson Griffin would be number two. And um, I don't believe that we would release Fluker and Britt if we didn't have anything up our sleeves. And so look for us to, to make a major splash within the next couple of months. And I hope it focuses around Griffin or Ngakwe. Logan Ryan wouldn't be a bad addition either, just because we didn't address the secondary in the draft, like you guys said earlier. And so um, Yannick Ngakwe, number one. Griffin, I mean, Everson Griffin, number two. And then Logan Ryan, number three. So there's... It kind of makes sense now with uh, the Seahawks making so many offensive line moves, uh, now losing these two veterans. Clearly, they needed those bodies in for competition and, and for depth and so forth. So it, it now starts to kind of make more sense. All those moves they were making, the writing was sort of on the wall, and, and then they confirmed it by doing so. Um, so the question is, who's going to be our center? You know, we we did we do have Joey Hunt. Does that mean we're going with Joey Hunt? Is he the guy, or is there? Or we? I, I, I kind of scares me. I I I sort of tremble at the thought of saying that. Uh, we see him get bowled over so many times, and not to knock the guy for his effort and what he does, but he's just a small dude, you know. And uh, we saw that happen a number of occasions where he just got bowled over, and then they had to kind of help uh, help him out a little bit. So, what do you guys think is going to happen with at center? Are we going to use one of these new guys we have, or uh, what's your thought on? on who takes Britt's place. Uh, uh, well, first of all, I'm, I'm still angry at New Orleans. Not only did they take our center in Max Unger, but they took our center in Cesar Ruiz that I wanted to draft in the NFL draft. I, I think now we go to – I was a small center when I played in high school. I understand the struggles. And sometimes there's just nothing you can do against those bigger guys. Like I weighed 220 in high school going up against guys like 380. I'm going to get worked. I need a double team here. Same thing with Joey Hunt in the NFL. He needs help at times. And so that's why I look at a guy like Ethan Posick, a guy we brought in years ago. He's had his injury concerns, but this is his opportunity to really take the torch. He's a guy that I, I've seen as a potential starter since he, we drafted him into uh, our team. And he's a physical player, LSU connection. Imagine him alongside Damian Lewis. Uh, I think that would be our go-to center just because he's been in the system for a while. As you guys know, I brought this up before, but it, it has been a while. Uh, at, this, at the position of center, you're the one, you're the captain of the offensive line. You're communicating with the quarterback. He's giving you all the, uh, the signals, the adjustments. You're out here calling out the defensive coverage, what the protection's going to be, who's blitzing, who, who's the mic, all these important things. And remember, you have to point all these things out with Without telling them what you're pointing out so I, I think it's important to have a guy that's been here and done that before so I think the guy that's really going to step up to the plate this offseason especially with the conditions once again you can't overestimate how the conditions are going to be with coronavirus uh, not being able to have as much time to practice and to build chemistry together which is going to be a struggle for an offensive line that we're kind of throwing together a little bit last minute so I think we go with the center that we know and that we've loved when we've had him he hasn't really played center for us played a lot of guard uh but ethan posick is a guy that's been there has the experience and we know plays physical the only problem with uh ethan posick though is as as shown by last year and one of the guys in the chat ori huang mentioned is that uh posick not exactly the most durable reliable guy though has had a lot of back injuries that's you know uh that's that's got to be a bit of a concern to put the weight of uh of the line on, on the one guy who possibly you know, is, is questionable in terms of his durability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's uh, that's something that we'll have to, to see moving forward. Uh, I know the Seahawks picked up somebody just recently, and I I forgot to note who he was. I think we got a cornerback. Uh, do you guys uh, know about that move in the last couple His days? Like Jason, Jason Taylor? Was it Jason Taylor? 
It was Jason something. It was Jason something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to look it up because I just just saw it and I forgot to make a, a better note of it. So I just thought you guys would know who that was, but maybe he's not exactly on everybody's radar. <sighs> Jason Stanley. There you go. Jason, Jason Stanley. Thank you, EHEC34. Thank you. So something tells me we probably don't know a whole heck of a lot of Jason Stanley. Do you guys know anything about this guy? I'm, I'm not going to lie. I mean, my first time hearing about him was when we signed him. And so, right. <laughs> Let's do a quick little bit of information off this guy. Jason was claimed, claimed off of waivers. That's right. He was claimed off waivers from... Uh, uh, where did he come from? From Jackson, from Jacksonville. Six foot two, two hundred ninety, two hundred nine pounds. Undrafted out of Georgia. Signed by the Falcons. Moved to cornerback. So he's one of those, yeah, receivers who became cornerback. Receiver who became cornerback. I remember somebody like that who was on the Seahawks at one point. Can't remember the name. Number twenty five. Very well. Worked out pretty well. Well, that, well, uh, th who knows? We'll see. But obviously, th th so they're doing some moves. I think they have been addressing some of those spots that they didn't hit in the draft. They've gotten some guys in the secondary in the uh, uh, undrafted group. Same with uh, D-Tackle. And uh, we'll just have to see if they find some real diamonds in the rough uh, when it comes to those, uh, those positions. Um, so... Yeah, a lot, lot, of, lot of things to be determined, but the, probably the biggest uncertainty right now is you know, a lot of talk of what's going to happen with this new potential NFL schedule. I believe the NFL said that we are should be expecting to he see something by May 9th, I think, was the, uh, the time frame that they said they would announce the, the, the new revised schedule. And I'm hearing everything from that they might possibly move this, you know, potentially they could move the Super Bowl back to late February. Uh, they could start the season later, you know, maybe move it down a month and maybe have no bye weeks. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, this is all kind of just speculation, nothing official out here yet. But I'm just curious what you guys think. What do you think on the, uh, the outlook of the season? Do you think we will have some form of one? And uh, which of these scenarios sounds more realistic of what uh, might happen? And uh, there's even been that talk where we just play our division opponents would be like the most brutal schedule you can imagine. But... Uh, except for the Rams, but uh, you know, what do you guys think? What do you think will happen uh, with this coming season? Any 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 gut instinct on what you think will be the the schedule moving forward? Uh, no, I mean, oh, guys, like Calvin, go for it, go for it, Calvin. <laughs> I think that uh, season's definitely gonna be pushed back. Um, there's been a lot of talk about that. So if there's one thing that I know for sure, season will be pushed back. Uh, as far as the other things that you were saying, like. The, you know, no bye weeks and, and all that. I think that'd be a terrible idea for the players. Even if the season was to be pushed back, like, let's say a month, uh, for them to just play, like, what, 15, 16, 17 uh, games in a row, like, every single week with no bye weeks, I just think that'd be a terrible idea. Because, I mean, even now there's a problem with, uh, with only one bye week. And so if you were to just, you know, take out all the bye weeks and then push the season back, uh, there's definitely some benefit in the season being pushed back a month. But I think that if that was to to come to light, then I think that'd be a terrible idea. Just because yeah. players, you know, they still need that rest. Um, and football, it's a brutal sport. And so even if the season being pushed back, I mean, you still need as much rest as possible, especially during the season. And so I think that'd be a terrible idea. Especially now with the expanded playoffs, uh, there's more teams joining the dance and i think there's less first round buys too right with this new formula so more teams are playing more players are going to be active in the early rounds of the of the playoffs as well so more work more body you know damage you know for these players and potentially less time to heal sounds like a bad idea i, I i'd say push it back you know i mean what's it gonna what's it gonna matter too much if they instead of going first week of february they go push it back another three, four weeks, you know? I think everything everything else just kind of adjusts until we can get back to, to normal. But Noah, what do you think? Well, there are a lot of things that you really have to consider when you play with a schedule as complicated as the NFL. And so what, one thing that you have to consider is, do you want this year to be such an outlier in the sense of there are different ways that we could adjust and remove games, but you can't just say, 
we're just going to remove week six for whoever plays whoever uh, through week one, and we're just not going to have those games because we don't we don't have that built out yet. How the schedule is built, as you guys know, you play your divisional teams twice, you play two other divisions, and then now you play two or three with the seventeen game season. Uh, uh, teams that finish with the same at the same place within their division and so how we could do it logistically uh to make teams have similar strengths of schedule you would put you'd basically do it so that teams don't play the other divisions opposite finishing teams so if we play the afc west we wouldn't play the chargers uh because they finished last and we finished second you know we wouldn't play the worst teams within their division but then we'd still have to play against the best so that would make it very difficult for seattle um that is really difficult to (laughs) i'm sorry oh sorry sorry about that my bad (laughs) they can't hear that but i know you can my bad sorry i've got i've got technical things going into into account into noah's ear messing up his train of thought but go on you're doing a great job you're doing a great job <laughs> so so yeah yeah so the games that we could eliminate it depends on do we really want this year to be such an outlier for these teams where they don't get an opportunity like for us C- seahawks fans our division is so tough if you take away those games that we play against the worst teams in other divisions our record might be a lot worse than it should be anyways and we already have a tough division and it's already a tough schedule so that makes it harder for us so then you look at potentially removing those games that are head-to-heads against divisions that you're not already playing this year so uh for us i think we play at philly or we play against philly it might be home or away but we're playing philly this year because we finished in the uh or excuse me not philly because they won dallas is who we're playing because we're not playing the nfc east but we are playing that team of the division and so it's one of those games do we remove that game because that's technically going to be between equal levels of talent because they finish up the same spot in their division i think realistically we got to remove the games that are against teams that finish with at the same spot in their division because that way we can knock out those two or three depending on how it is with the 16 or 17 game season and then after that we start to look at those divisions that we're playing against you got to keep all six of those divisional games i think you start by taking away those those games against teams that finish at the same spot in their division and then you go to the divisional games uh, where we're playing opposite divisions and we start by eliminating the team so if you're the one seed you don't play the four seed and if you're the one seed on this side you don't play this four seed Wow, you really got this thing figured out, man. <laughs> Give it some thought. I like it. Um, so I just had a thought here since we've we, we've kind of come to the uh, end of the content I wanted to talk about. Uh, but you guys still got a couple minutes left to, to chat? Okay. Oh, yeah. Man, of course, of course. All right. Uh, so I wanted to see about see, opening the lines up. We haven't done a call line thing with you guys on uh, online as well. It's quite the technical challenge here, but we're going to see if we can do it. Uh, so I'm going to open up the lines, uh, which the screen, the number's on the screen, 515-606-5121, and then enter the code 696-153. And we're going to take just a few calls here uh, and see if we can answer your questions. And uh, let's go from there and see what we got. I got one person on the line here. Let's see, uh, let's see what they've got to say, and hopefully you guys will be able to hear this. All right. Uh, who's this? You're on with Norb, Cam, Calvin, and Noah. Who's this, and where are you calling from? Uh, hello? Yeah, you are live. What's right, your name? Right. Uh, I'm going to say my last name, uh, Ortega. O- Ortega? Yeah. Okay. And what's your first name? Uh, Alexander. Alexander. Okay, Alexander. Uh, hey, Calvin Alexander. and Noah, can you can you hear can you hear him? Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. All right. Nice uh, to so, meet you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for joining the show. Um, uh, what's on your mind? Do you have a question for what, uh, anyone in particular, or just a general question that we uh, can answer, or just a comment? What's on your mind? Not really. I was just I was just here, uh, just wondering, uh, just hopefully that just uh, what's your thoughts on the draft? That's all. Hmm. Okay. Uh, we, we touched on that a little bit earlier in the show, and I, I thank you for the call. But uh, I guess we could we could go back and just again maybe just a re, re, review our grades again, and, and just give sort of like the elevator pitch. If you're in an elevator and so says, "Hey man, so what'd you think about the Seahawks draft this year?" and you had four floors, four, five, six floors to do it, what would you say, Calvin? Go. 
I give us a, a B minus. Uh, we reached on a few guys, but I think overall, if Seattle's happy with the guys that they took. I'm happy. No. Um, I'm really bad on the elevator. So what I can tell you is that. <laughs> I, I, so I, is it okay? Is it okay? Can I give them a little bit of the stuff that I didn't really dive into before? Because there, oh, there sure. is a little bit more that I got. Okay, you're so you're you're, DJ, you're on the el- you're on the elevator in the uh, world uh, in, uh, in the Empire State Building. So you have a longer uh, uh, ride to the top. So go ahead. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. So, so uh, uh, DJ Dallas, first of all, I actually like this pick. This is a guy that's explosive. Uh, Calvin mentioned the fact that he's raw, but he's a guy that plays with Seattle's mentality. Uh, part of the reason that we brought him in is because he's such a Swiss Army knife. He can play the Wildcat. He's returned kicks. That's a special teamer for us. Another guy that I like that we added late. Uh, I didn't love the fit in terms of our wide receiver core, but I didn't think through the draft we should get at least one. And this is also why it made it so confusing for me that we added Stefan Sullivan was because we added Freddie Swain. And Freddie Swain is a guy, uh, he he padded his stats down there uh, at Florida, and he did a nice job uh, at, in the return game as well. So we added two return guys in the draft that can compete back there with Rashad Penny and Tyler Lockett, of course. Uh, Both of these guys are shifty, electric, they make plays, and Freddie Swain is really good at extending plays with his quarterback. That's part of the reason that we brought him in. Him and Russell in a scramble drill, that would be something beautiful to watch. So, like like Calvin, I say the Seahawks get a B-, minus. but some of those guys that we drafted later on, just like Alton Robinson, he only had four sacks last year, but he had ten the year before. Sacks are going to be up and down like he said in his uh, press conference after getting drafted, but he's been up here working with Cliff Averill in the facility that off a lot of Seahawks work at. Uh, Bobby Wagner, KJ Ryder, some of the guys that go in there, and he's been working exclusively at position techniques. Uh, the difference he was saying between getting a sack and just getting pressure on the quarterback is what the focus was on. So I think Alton Robinson is going to be big. I think DJ Dallas can come in and we can we can use him as a gadget guy. We can give him the ball to pass down the field. And then Freddie Swain, a special teamer that, as a wide receiver, can help scramble down the stretch of the season. Uh, we could use him in a game like Week 17 against San Francisco if it comes down to the wire and we have injury problems in our wide receiver core. And as I said, my take on the draft, I, get, I started out with a B-, minus, got over my shock, soaked it in, upgraded it to a B. Uh, didn't like the Jordan Brooks linebacker pick. I thought it was too early. I thought it was a reach, but I'm still hopeful he will contribute. And maybe we have more of an issue at that linebacker position with Michael Kendrick's future still to be determined with his jail sentence. And so maybe they were looking at that as, as possibly something that needed to be addressed sooner than later. Um, and I, I think my favorite pick, I said over time as I did some of my research, was the tight end Colby Parkinson. Uh, just his size, uh, his uh, his good hands. Uh, again, I kind of said this is like a Jimmy Graham uh, and a guy who likes to block. So the thought of him and uh, Will Disley going side by side or or end to end blocking and going out for uh, receiving uh, receiving passes down the line from Russell uh, gets me a bit excited. So uh, that's what I'm looking forward to most from uh, the two guys. All right. I, I got two guys, one who I was disappointed in, so that I really hope he delivers because you never like to see a top draft pick not not work out. So I'm really hopeful that he'll prove me wrong, uh, linebacker Jordan Brooks. Uh, let's go to the next uh, phone call. I've got um, uh, Seahawks Martin, who joined us last time, but he wasn't able to join us this time because he had to practice his piano. Seahawks Martin, you must be done with your music. Uh, is that the case now? You're available to talk? Um, actually, my dad is in the meeting right now, so I'm free to go, thank God. Oh, you you are free? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Man, I thought... that take a while. <laughs> <laughs> are you sitting at your piano? Could you hammer out a couple tunes for us while we're listening? <laughs> no, I'm not at the piano. And my dad's in the meeting right now, so I can't really play. Oh, um, doggone I mean, it. My, my mom made me both clothes, so um, I don't play passing right now. Oh, okay. Uh, anyway, what was on your mind, uh, Martin? What you got? Uh, you were talking about like the draft. Uh, and you said I didn't like um, the Jordan Brooks pick. Um, I honestly at the at, um, at first too, but like when you look at his highlight, um, he is just a tackling machine. Like literally, a lot of people say like he gets his tackles. Jumping is really good. I don't think um, drafting him for coverage, but it was more of tackling because like 
we our um, defense had a lot of trouble tackling last year. That's true. Um, That's true. And I that with him coming in, I think that um, hopefully our tackling game can just be a little better. Uh, that's a good point. Um, you know, maybe we we need to uh, we do have to look at, at at the tackling. I think a lot of times people don't look at the stats on tackling. It's not as sexy to look at as sacks and all these other interceptions and things like that. But tackling, you know, I do agree with Martin that last year there was some very suspect tackling. And usually the Seahawks are a very good tackling team. You know, they talked about the rugby style tackling philosophy that they were using and teaching for a while. And I just wonder, did they get away from some of that, or is it just the nature of the NFL now that they don't really do as much contact and practices have players just forgotten how to tackle you know we need to bring camp chancellor back in there show them how to light them up but uh i agree that we need to get the tackling solid because there was a lot of missed tackles uh last year so i have to agree with you guys you got any comment on that yeah Yeah. i'm definitely with them oh go ahead ahead, with them uh kj Wright, he had a career year for us but i did notice that there was a little bit of slippage in his game i saw a whole lot of missed tackles that i'm usually not used to seeing from kj Wright. and so jordan brooks he has you know much needed speed and athleticism to our uh to our linebacking core and just to our defense overall because we were one of the worst teams uh, against the run and so uh brooks he brings a whole lot of run stoppage to the table as well and uh even if he was a reach i feel like because we selected a defensive player, uh, we could really just use more help on defense, uh, period, just because our defense was so bad last year. And so Jordan Brooks, he brings much-needed uh, athleticism, quickness, speed. And so, yeah, I'm excited to see what he brings to the table. Well, with with Jordan Brooks, when, what I saw from watching him on tape, it, these are two things that I am absolutely thrilled about adding him to our linebacker core because of this, is that he's extremely disciplined and he has great instincts. As a defensive football player, as a linebacker, you are taught to read your keys when the play begins. You watch the, the feet of the offensive line. Do they step back first? Do they step forward? Uh, where's their hat? Is Are they high hat, low hat? It all changes, if they're high hat, pass protection. If they're low hat, they're run blocking. Uh, you're reading their keys. You're watching the fullback. Uh, you, you've watched film all week so that you figure out these things that if this team runs this on offense, that means that they're going to run this play. So if you see the wide receiver go in motion and then the fullback uh, has his hand in the ground, it means they're faking the, the option outside and they're actually going to hand it to the running back. Like there are certain keys that you follow. Jordan Brooks is extremely good at locking into his keys and not letting all of the, the, the beautiful motion picture in front of him that offense is trying to do where quarterbacks are faking passes. They're out here pretending to hand the ball to one guy and giving it to the other. Jordan Brooks doesn't fall for that. He doesn't fall for the uh, the pulling offensive lineman, the wide receiver motions. He stays disciplined, and he doesn't get beat down the field. That's why it's such a great point that Seahawks Martin brought up that we struggle to tackle. Uh, Jordan Brooks is the guy that's going to be there, and he's going to make the tackle that's going to save big plays for us defensively. I agree KJ Wright had a bad year last year. And another problem that we had, we had it at, at Green Bay. Uh, well, and it was situational tackling and situational playmaking uh, on our defense. When it was third and two, we couldn't get a stop. When it was a two point conversion, we couldn't hold him out. That's what I see from Jordan Brooks, having watched his highlights ever since we drafted him. <laughs> uh, he, he's a guy that. Uh, he makes plays when it's needed the most. He watches a lot of film. He knows what he's looking at, and his instincts are phenomenal. So he goes out there and he makes plays. He's not afraid to hit. Uh, but most importantly, he doesn't get beat down the field, and that is so huge for us uh, as a team that struggled to tackle last year. Well, and I think being able to read through all that noise and misdirection and pre-snap movement uh, is going to be important, especially when we play teams like the Rams, who love to do that kind of stuff, and the 49ers. They do a lot of motion, a lot of uh, uh, just uh, stuff to kind of disguise what they're going to do. So, again, I'm hoping he's going to rise up to his first pick for the Seahawks level and uh, just be a major impact, uh, especially with these teams against the, uh, the NFC West. So, oh... Thank you, my my beautiful daughter Vanessa. Just brought me some treats. Keep me going here while uh, I'm doing the show. <laughs> Thanks, Vanessa. All right, I'm going to go to my next uh, caller here. We got somebody. I think this is Sam out of Kentucky, if I'm not mistaken. Is this Sam? Sam, uh, are you with? Hello. Uh, Who is this? Uh, Martin, you accidentally unmuted me. 
Oh, Martin. So oh, sorry, I got the wrong number. Sorry, Martin. I thought we were done talking. Hey, uh, I hope. <laughs> sorry, Martin. I hope we answered your question. Sorry, I'm going to keep you on the line, but I want to get through some other callers here. Uh, this. No, not this guy. Let me get my controls right. Here we go, Sam. I'm like, where is it? Sam from Kentucky. Hey. Is this you? Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up? How's it hey, going? Uh, I didn't know. I'm doing good. I didn't realize y'all would. I would remember my name, but uh, yeah, I'm doing all right. What's on your mind today, Sam? Well, um, you know, I've just been wondering because with uh, all these trades and stuff going on, um, you know, 2018 Rams were the team to beat. Uh, 2019, the Niners were the team to beat in the NFC. And, uh, you know, like, with the Cardinals getting D-Hop and getting all these players and drafting uh, way up in the first round, I mean, like, who are they going to be the team to beat, or is this the Seahawks here? Because the Seahawks have come in second place in the NFC West for, like, three years in a row. Uh, do, you, do you all think that we have the energy to, to take the number one spot for the first time in a while? That's a really good question. Uh, Noah, what's your take on that? Do you think uh, this is the Seahawks' year to re get, recapture that mantle uh, of the, the NFC West? I have some thoughts, but I hear from you guys first. Well, I know he's just on the phone, but everyone watching can see what I'm wearing and already knows. Let's go Hawks, man. Hawks are going to retake this division, and here is why. Unless we get bit by the injury bug to the extreme degree that we were last season, losing offensive linemen, tight ends, running back. That is our whole offense right there. Russell Wilson was running for his life. He led our playoff game that we lost in rushing yards uh, for our team. He did a phenomenal job in that game, and he was carrying the Seahawks on his back. Now imagine having these running backs, Chris Carson, Rashad Penny, DJ Dallas now in there, Colby Parkinson, alongside these other tight ends, Stephon Solo, Will Disley, Greg Olson. We have added a lot of pieces. Our wide receiving core is strong. Our offense is solid. As long as we don't get bit by the injury bug, I think Seattle is the team to beat in this division. San Francisco did have a phenomenal draft, and I graded, I graded them an A, and I would say they're the biggest competitor outside of Seattle. I think those are the two main. I think the Cardinals make the playoffs as a surprise team that a lot of teams uh, people are sleeping on because they didn't watch them last year. But I watched a lot of Arizona Cardinals football last year. Their offense was hit or miss it was explosive now they add deandre hopkins uh they added uh clay uh excuse me isaiah simmons in the draft which, which was an excellent addition and an offensive lineman they had a really good draft so i think this whole division is going to be extremely competitive outside of the rams of course but remember the rams beat us when they were bad and we were good so I, i'm never gonna uh, take a rams game for granted i think seattle wins the division i think it's close to san francisco and i think arizona comes in third and makes the playoffs Calvin, your thoughts? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm with Noah. Uh, I don't really have anything else to add as far as uh, you know our on our Hawks, but I feel like with the with the Cardinals, it's a little too early just because you know Kyler Murray he's just going into his second year. Even though they did get Isaiah Simmons in the draft, their defense still has a lot of issues. And um, but I, I do like the logic that you bring up. You know, there's always a new team. You know, uh, in the lead for for the NFC West crown, but I just think that it's too early for the Cardinals. Uh, I'm with Noah, though. I do think that the Cardinals will sneak in into the playoffs as a, as a final seed. Um, but I think we're, they're still maybe a year or two away from being true contenders for the NFC West crown. All right. I'm going to say right. this, man. We should have been NFC West champs last year, okay? Missed it by this much, and we shouldn't have even had to have done that because if we didn't lose our minds when when uh, John Rasua got the first down at the one yard line, if we just were prepared for that, Bismo would have gone over the top, scored the winning touchdown, and we would have had the euphoria that we deserved to end that game, beating the 49ers, having the NFC West crown. It would have changed the entire dynamics of the playoffs. The 49ers probably don't even go to the Super Bowl. Who knows where we end up uh, if that situation is play it stays. So I'm going to stick with what I said about this coming season, that Seattle's going to take the number one spot. The Cardinals are going to somehow, buy, even though the 49ers had an excellent draft, the Cardinals are somehow going to rise above and edge the 49ers by, the, the, by a nose hair. By the same margin that we lost to the 49ers, they're going to beat the 49ers in the, for second place. 49ers are going to be right behind them, and the Rams are going to be down scrubbing toilets, and we are going to eat up the competition in NFC West like I'm going to eat this piece of garlic bread right here. <laughs> and that's what's going to happen, baby. 
And I forgot to have a yeah, napkin to wipe I, my hands off with. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, I think so. Uh, <laughs> what do you think about that, Sam? Last year, too. last year, we were definitely Super Bowl caliber, especially at the first half of the season. Like, we, we were on fire. Russell Wilson uh, was better than Lamar by far. Um, but, like, we started sliding in the last half of the season. Injuries were killing us. I mean, if we had, if we had kept Britt, if we had kept – Bisley, I mean, if Chris Carson stayed healthy. We would have been extremely good this year. I think. I think it's it's going to be a great year. I like our schedule a lot. I like the teams we're going to play. I think they're going to be beatable. Um, we're probably going to have some surprise games. Obviously, you know, you know, Washington might beat us in some sort of fluke or something. You know, it, it always happens every year. But I be I think that this year, uh, I think I think we got it. I think we're going to be really well. And I really hope we can win a Super Bowl because that would be. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. I agree with you, Sam. I'm going to uh, go with that. You got me all inspired here, and I'm uh, I'm going to take that and keep running with it. Seattle first, Arizona second, and uh, 49ers third. But you know, one thing at a time. But I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to make that my uh, my my uh, my crazy prediction right here. And hopefully by September we'll have a chance to actually you know prove that thing but Sam thanks for the call appreciate it man let's go to another caller here uh, from Montana I think let's see who's this who's this where you call from I'm from deep Montana you are from Montana what's your name yeah tell Phil tell K tell tell Oh, tell, tell. Oh, there you go. Tell, tell. All right, tell, do tell us what's on your mind today, man. Um, yeah. So I have a question for Noah. Do you think Lynch is going to come back? Oh, Lynch. Last year, I was surprised when Lynch came back. Lynch was came back last year. I was, like, happy. We talked about it last year. I mean, it wasn't in the plans. I mean, it was in the plans... When our our running back core got devastated, so is it in the plans this year? I know, I Calvin, I think we talked about this in one of our previous shows. But just since not everybody was listening to it, and Tell was not uh, didn't catch that last program, what's your thoughts? Does does Marshawn Lynch play with the Seahawks or any other team for that matter? Um, I'm I'm sticking with the same standpoint that I had before, and it's that. Like you said, Norv, he wasn't on the plan to come back last year. It took uh, everything hitting the fan on a Wednesday in September for us to even sign him. Uh, and even then, we only signed him for a couple of games. I think Marshawn Lynch is just the guy that, like, we have his number in our phone already. So if all of our running backs go down, we're just going to hit him on speed dial. Like, hey, man, you know the system. You're an energy boost. We need you to run, like, three uh, third and ones for us in the next two games if you're available to do that. You know, it'd be great. And so that's why I think the only situation that we bring back on Marshawn Lynch is if everyone else gets injured. Right. And what I, do you I think agree. about I don't think he comes back. Just because, you know, we did draft a running back in DJ Dallas, and I don't expect for Rashad Penny, Chris Carson to, to suffer season ending injuries again. But it is football, and so anything can happen. I think that uh Beast Mode he'll be on speed dial, but I think uh he won't be playing for, for any other team. Besides us, if it comes to us. What do you think so. of what do you think about Luke, J, uh, DJ Fluco and Justin Britt gone? Well, I, I don't think it was a fluke that they both were uh, off the. Man, I got the puns just going to town here. Uh, well, as we discussed earlier, uh, the numbers don't lie, right? You look at the salary, twelve point two million. I think you said uh, Noah that the releasing those two guys and with all the offensive linemen they were bringing in, uh, not to mention drafting one with their third pick in the draft. Clearly, they were going to be moving away from that. Draft? What do you think about the draft? Um, well, we did just do a breakdown of that. I think you guys both gave the draft a B minus. I gave it a B. Uh, we won't go the entire recap again of that, but um, I guess to, and to what just do you think about. Go ahead. What did you think about um, um, that um, we got um, Bush Urban and um, and we got back um, Bush Urban and 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 Benson. we got Mayola. and we got Craig Olson. Uh, oh, you're talking about all the... Well, yeah, okay, so kind of recapping, I guess, some of our earlier free agency moves. And, and Tell, I appreciate the call. Thank you so much. Um, I guess, well, yeah, we, we could sort of recap 
in a way, looking back at, at some of the other free agent signings, you know, which which of them maybe are the ones that are your most hopeful? You know, Bruce Irvin coming back, Benson Mayoa, who was a former Seahawk as well, and then Greg Olson, former Panthers Seahawks tight end killer. He had some back breaking plays against us, and now he gets to be on our team. I guess which of those three guys? I, I'm probably the biggest names that are that are coming back to Seattle. If I'm well, well no, we also got. Um, uh, 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 Dunbar, Quentin Dunbar, also a big name coming, and then Philip Dorsett. So you know, it just kind of brings back to mind the uh, a lot of names that they have brought in that we have to get excited about. Which are you most excited of that of that bunch that you feel like is going to make an immediate impact on the Seahawks of those uh, free agents? Uh, Calvin, I'm going to say Greg Olson, just because I think that if Will Disley can stay healthy, he's going to unlock a whole lot of new packages for us on offense. Uh, We saw a few years back when New England was very successful running a two tight end offense with, you know, Gronk and Aaron Hernandez. Uh, I think we could somewhat mimic some of those packages that that Bill Belichick was rolling out with with those two. Um, We can create a whole lot of mismatches. And and Greg Olson, he's not just a terrific pass catcher. He's a great run blocker as well. And that's what we look for in our tight ends besides Jimmy Graham. Um, And so I think that if Will Disley is able to stay healthy and, you know, we put him on the field with Greg Olson – we're creating a whole lot of mismatches. We have two gigantic targets for Russ, you know, in addition to DK. And we also have Colby Parkinson, who we drafted, a 6'7", 250-pound tight end. Um, so I think I'm most excited about Greg Olson just because he can open up a whole lot of things for us, especially offensively. And, you know, Russ loves hitting those big guys in the end zone if we're not running it. And so I'm most excited about Greg Olson for sure. How about you, Noah? Who, who do you get most excited about of those names that we talked about? Well, this, this is a fun question to answer. Who's the most exciting that we get to bring in? First of all, you make a great point with Greg Olson. Uh, but just to give a different opinion or a different look on things, I'd say Quentin Dunbar. I think Quentin Dunbar is going to have the ability this year in Seattle to not only win the starting job, to not only play a corner for us at a much higher level than Trey Flowers, but I think he's going to have, if we play a full season, my – crazy wild prediction five to six interceptions on the year i could see him having a huge year uh from our secondary because you always see those guys when they're not quite as developed when they're not quite as known that's when quarterbacks are still making the mistake of throwing to their side quentin dunbar is not a huge name but i predict that he is going to be i think he has an outbreaking year this season i think he has five or six interceptions i think he returns at least one for a touchdown and i think this is his chance uh to play with a team that really fits his style well uh, that that wants him to come play for us uh similar to richard sherman uh the the wide receiver to cornerback the instincts are there he can run routes he jumps passes he jumps balls he's dropped him in the past i don't think he does it this year quentin dunbar uh that's who i'm excited to see you know just just all this talk and recapping all these names and recapping the draft i'm getting I'm getting kind of tingling here, guys. I'm getting kind of excited. I, I just start thinking, you know, you start bringing up some pictures, and, and, and I start thinking, what was the things that really frustrated us last year as Seahawks fans? You mentioned Trey Flowers. How many times did we f- see Trey Flowers over and over again feel like he was given like a 20-yard cushion and watching guys just in, cut inside and catch the ball? How many times did we see receivers going unabated across the middle, no, no one in coverage, getting the ball, a catch for like five yards and then running for another 15, 20 down the field. That happened way too much. How many times do we not see us getting pressure on the quarterback? That just didn't happen enough. How many times do we see Russell Wilson running, scrambling for his life? Uh, too much. And now you start plugging in these, these people who you feel like these were the problems And now we've got answers. We've got Dunbar, who I'm excited to see him do the non-Trey Flowers-ish moves there, like you just said, and some additional interceptions. You got that. And then now we've got our number one uh, pick was our our first pick was was addressing the linebacker, who I like to hope will be a big part of helping clog up that middle that we were so frustratingly seeing guys coming across the middle. Um, We've got uh, tight ends now coming up kind of out of our butts, which is going to open up more blocking, more passes down the lanes, down the seams, you know, that we couldn't do because we only had one going out there. We only had one option. And then we've got, uh, you know, the existing running back plus an additional one, uh, more wide receivers. Not to, We haven't even talked about Philip Dorsett yet here, and he's no slouch, right? So add mm-hmm. that to an already very talented receiving core. And then the fact that we still got who we got, which is Russell Wilson at the helm. Uh, the other standout 
veterans who are already there. If you call, can call him a veteran now, Shaquille Griffin, uh, who's been proving himself a solid lockdown left corner. You got Bobby Wagner still in there on top of his game. K.J. Wright, yeah, he didn't have a great year last year, but I still feel like he's still one of the better linebackers in the business, but he's going to get some help now. Uh no, what's that to get excited about, guys? And we missed the, the division by that much. And so, and we should have beat the Packers, for crying out loud. I mean, we did so much with so many holes. And now I feel like those holes have been very well addressed. Yeah, we haven't gotten clowny. Yeah, we didn't get that pass rusher off the edge. But we still might. We might still get Nagakwe or, or Griffin. Probably not clowny. But if we don't get one of those guys, we already have addressed the 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 defensive end pass rush position, you know, quite a bit two in the draft, and you know, there's still other options, and we still got like L.J. Collier who's still got something to prove, try to prove that he was worth worth the the first uh, pick of last year's draft. Uh, Jaron Reed who's getting his number ninety back, and he was much more productive at number ninety, and I think that's the all the difference. He was wearing the wrong number last year, and there's something magic about number ninety. When you wear number ninety, you play really. I think if I put on number ninety, and jumped on that field, I would probably get half a sack just because I'm wearing number ninety. So now that Jaron Reed's got his re- real number back, where he got like, well, how many sacks did he get? Ten and a half, eleven sacks. I'm telling you, man, it's all the stars are lining up. I don't think people realize it. You guys might need to change your attitude about your B minus uh, grade on the draft and move up to a B like I did. Jump on the bandwagon here because I'm, I'm getting fired up just talking about this, and I haven't even seen a single highlight, a single practice, and yet all of a sudden I feel like this is a Super Bowl team, and nothing has oh. even happened. Am I crazy or what? Maybe I'm no, crazy. You're not crazy. Maybe, I need, maybe I'm getting low on blood sugar. I don't know, but whatever it is, I'm just getting hype. I'm getting on the super hype Seahawks train right now. Um, <laughs> it's the garlic bread. It's the garlic, it's the garlic bread. bread, which I've already, you know, I went to town bread. on. All right, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to go to the phone lines again. This time I'm going to bring my resident non-excited uh, 49er fan, Rohan from uh, Northern California. Rohan, are you there? Um, yes, I am there. And that's exactly the kind of answer and energy I expected you to bring when you when you answered the first question of, of this phone call. So come on, man. Bring me something, man. I'm all juiced up here. Tell me something. Prove to me why the 49ers are not going to be third place in the division like I'm thinking that they will be. Go. Oh, I was about to say that I was just going to leave the Niners predictions alone and let it take care of itself. That's no fun. That's no fun. You predicted the Niners for third place in the division? Who would you predict for second, then? Arizona Cardinals by a nose hair. You drunk the Cardinals, cool, didn't you? Hey, man, they, had, they got Hopkins. They drafted that Simmons guy. Second year for what's-his-face, that quarterback. He's going to be better. What's his name? Kyler Murray. I'm telling you, man. The 49ers are going to drop a couple games that they should win. Uh, prove me wrong, man. I don't care if you don't want to do well, prediction. I'm telling you. Just... That last year. The Niners dropped a lot of games that they could have won. Um, let's see. The Niners, let's see. Why, okay, let me come up with an argument for the Niners, for why the Niners aren't going to be third place. Um, let's see. They had a lot of holes that opened up over free agency that they need to fill during the draft, such as defensive tackle. They lost their all-pro defensive tackle for the last four years, who has been carrying the defense for most of his career, and DeForest Buckner. So he had gone to Indianapolis. They lost Emmanuel Sanders. Um, Joe Staley, the greatest offensive lineman in 49ers history and future Hall of Famer, also retired over this weekend. And they replaced all of those guys. Now, whether I use and and, 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 Lock, and, and Joe Staley gets replaced by um, the guy Trent Williams yeah. from the Redskins. Do you remember when he and Richard Sherman got to got to, to, to fist the cuffs at the end of the uh, wild card? I think it was a wild yeah. card. No, no, it was a regular season game. But they, remember, no, Richard Sherman card. got into his face. Was it a wild card when they won? It was. It was. Okay, it was a wild card. Beat but yeah, traffic. yeah, yeah. He was grab. Yeah, yeah. And then Trent Williams kind of took a took a swing, kind of a swing. It was like more of a gentle slap, if anything. Is but um, those two on the same team, man. We might have some. You know, they might bring up old wounds and have some locker room, ba- you know, battles behind the scenes there, man. I know that they don't play on the same side of the ball, but maybe that's the thing. Maybe they'll be on the outside side of the ball, reopening some old wounds. Might affect that locker room chemistry, man. <laughs> Yeah. Well, <laughs> locker. Well, championship locker rooms don't exactly last forever. I mean, I know you guys can attest with all those locker room cancers that happened after you guys lost the Super Bowl. Um, but yeah, I, I'm. 
I'm excited for Trent Williams. Honestly, if there was anyone currently in the league that I would rather have replaced Joe Staley, it would be a healthy Trent Williams. And honestly, Trent Williams might have been an upgrade over Joe Staley, to be honest. I mean, Joe Staley never put fear into defensive linemen. Trent Williams, is, like, I see highlight reels of him throwing guys like Chandler Jones and uh, Joey Bosa to the ground. So, yeah, I'd say he puts fear into defensive linemen. I like that. All right, okay, Rohan, so you, you've been making a nice argument so far, but you're, you're ignoring the elephant in the room, okay? You're ignoring the biggest problem that the 49ers have. And that's the quarterback. quarterback. You have not addressed <laughs> oh, the Jimmy Garoppolo. So how do you defend the quarterback who blew the opportunity to win the Super Bowl and defeat <clears throat> the Kansas City Chiefs with one throw? It could have made him the man me in history, taking the place over the catch with uh, Montana to Dwight Clark, overthrew it by like five yards. And then look like a hot mess after that. Uh, are you still a believer in Jimmy Garoppolo? Or what do you have to say for those like us who have our doubts about Jimmy Garoppolo leading this team forward to the promised land? Um, I'll defend him by saying, look at what he did late. Look at what he did over the final few weeks of the season last year. I mean, he played, he played some really good games against the Saints. He had, like, the game of his life. Against the Seahawks in Week 17, he couldn't miss a pass to save his life. And against the Rams, he drove the he drove the team down the field. Well, Sanders kind of helped with that. But yeah, he he played really well late season last year and got and was a huge part of why the Niners were even the one seed to begin with. And when you saw the, what the Niners were like when he was injured in 2018, when they went four and twelve, so he's definitely a key piece for the Niners and. Whether he um, repeats that performance next year is to be determined, but um, I'm feeling optimistic based on the pieces that the Niners got him this offseason, whether it be Trent Williams on the left side or Ayuk or, yeah, or who was that wide receiver they drafted in the seventh round? Who was you're, you're asking me? I don't know. <laughs> it's yeah. not my team. Oh, I, know. Oh, I remember his name. I, I wasn't even watching Jenny. TV anymore. Oh, oh, okay. Um, Jenny, hey, so yeah, let, let's go. Name. Let's go to. I want to talk to my, uh, my my guys here. So Noah and Calvin. Noah, you first. Uh, what 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 do you think of of Jimmy Garoppolo? Since we're on the subject. Well, I mean, it. Well, if there was, first of all, if there was ever a 49er fan, I would want to watch a Seahawks Niners game at a bar with. It would probably be Rohan. Uh, because he's not he's not toxic for that reason. Uh, Jimmy G, so you brought up the game that he had against Seattle last year as one of the best games where he was perfect in his career. How many points did they score in the second half of that game? Didn't it come down to defense barely pulling it out, uh, and it 13. was only because of his defense? Like, I don't recall Jimmy G winning that game. That game you mentioned about the Saints, he played great for the majority of it, but I don't think he was the one that won that game. I think that was George Kittle when he ran rampage over the entire Saints defense and made a huge play. Uh, he had the ball at home versus the Seahawks in that, uh, what was it, week 10 game uh, where in overtime where he was put set up in position after Wilson threw the interception. He had the ball in opponent's territory and couldn't even get him in makeable field goal range for their kicker. Well, I mean, their kicker missed it, but he couldn't even go put the, the stamp on that game and win that ball game. And then come the playoffs, uh, none of the NFC side of the whole thing, the whole tournament was close because of the fact that Seattle lost the division. And then come Super Bowl time, he had an opportunity to be the Super Bowl MVP, and he didn't get it done. So even though they did fill a lot of those holes, like you said about Seattle when we lost the Super Bowl, it creates that those locker room cancers. Well, between Seattle and San Francisco, uh, which team lost the most recent Super Bowl? Because I'm pretty sure it was San Francisco last year. The Rams lost it the year before, and we already saw the impact that it had on them. Jimmy G's whole thing is confidence. Like, that's everything about him. They call him an uh, inappropriate name, Jimmy, because he is so handsome and devilish looks. He has the, the quarterback face and the quarterback jawline. And he's so, you know, he, he's got that confidence, that swag. 
Well, what's going to happen now that he has a whole, what, eight months to think about how he screwed it up at the biggest stage possible with a chance to be MVP and be on top of the world while watching the best guy at that position on the other side of it go down and take the game and the championship from him? You can't trust Jimmy G come playoff time. You can't trust him when the game's on the line. He won that game against the Rams because Jalen Ramsey had a miscommunication and coverage the only other comebacks that he had on the year were pretty much against Arizona, and that's when Arizona was bad and ended up with a top NFL draft pick. So I don't trust in Jimmy G at all heading into this year. When it matters the most, uh, that confidence turns to fear. Calvin, your take. Man, once again, I mean, Noah kind of hit all the points. Uh, I think with Jimmy G, I think at his very best, he's a game manager. Uh, <laughs> Noah talked about his, his failures. <laughs> In the, in the playoffs, he has all this talent around him. He has a, a great head coach. He has a, a, a great running game. He has a great defense, if not the best defense in football. I mean, what more can he ask for? And yet he was unable to deliver, um, and not even just in the Super Bowl. There were plenty of moments in the playoffs. Uh, while I like Jimmy G, he's solid. I think he, he does get a little too much hate from my Seahawks fans. Uh, I just don't think that he's the guy to lead a team to the Super Bowl. I mean, last year was, was their year, and he was unable to deliver. I don't expect – for him to, to just all of a sudden come back next year, what, at age 28, age 29, to all of a sudden just be the best version of himself. Um, I think last year was kind of his, his peak. I think that was the best that we were going to see from Jimmy G. And and you can't tell me that a couple years ago when you guys went 4-12, and 12, he was not the reason why you guys were that bad. He, he He's not – I mean, there were a lot of things that went wrong for you guys that year, and definitely him missing a, a large chunk of it due to a torn ACL played a part in that. But he is not the only reason why you guys went 4-12. and 12. Uh, once again, no hit all the points. And so, uh, at his very best, he's a game manager. I just want to say, get off this trade of hating on Jimmy G. He's the best quarterback in the world. Leave Rohan alone. Rohan's a good guy. He's not annoying like other 49ers fans like myself. But... Get off him. Yeah, he's the best looking quarterback in the world. He's got like way better looks than than, than, than Russell Wilson, that scraggly hairdo that he's got going on. And and, <laughs> and, and, and Jimmy G, he they wouldn't even been in the Super Bowl without Jimmy G. So leave him alone. He's the best quarterback ever. You guys are mean. Go away. <laughs> Christosimo, isn't it past your bedtime or something? Like, come on, man. Shut up, man. You're just a little boy. You're just a boy among men. I'll go to bed when I want to. Dude, I'll have a Shut up. Okay. <laughs> e, I'm out. Leave Jimmy G alone. Hashtag, I love Jimmy G. E, bye. <laughs> hey, man, you guys really got Sosmo riled up there. Uh, I think he, he, he said everything that Rohan meant to say, but Rohan couldn't quite get it out there. But, uh, well, look, we had a sugar rush today. First <laughs> all, <laughs> Oh man, I I did not think this was going to turn into a hate Jimmy G session. Um, it, it really was not my plan. I didn't even expect to talk about the 49ers. Really, this was supposed to be a Seahawks draft to talk about DJ Fluker and stuff. But man, this is this whenever thing I come on the call, it usually turns into 49ers. So, <laughs> well, you 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 brought it on because you showed up here. That's what you get. That's what you get for uh, for coming to a Seahawks party, bringing your 49ers swag in here, man. I'm just saying. You mess with the bull, you get the horns. You mess with the beak, you get the talons. Wait, that didn't make any sense. Anyway, uh, so it's, it's good to have you on board, man. And, uh, you know, good luck, man. You're the coolest 49er fan I know because you're not annoying. Yes. <laughs> we appreciate that. All right, Rohan. Stay safe, man. It was good having you on. We love you, Rohan. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right, sorry if I cut you off there, but you are a 49ers fan, so I'll talk to you later. All right, we're gonna go to the four, we're gonna go to the five oh nine. Uh, keep this uh, hate train going. Yo, what's up? Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello, Spokane. Yeah, Spokane. My, Hello? I got family out there. Where? Uh, yep. What's your name? What's your name? My name is Josh. Josh from Spokane. So what's up? What's on your mind today? Yep. All right. So this has been about. Uh oh. The Packers drafting Jordan Love. Ah. Is that kind of like a wake up call for Aaron Rodgers? Like, um, what do you think of that? 
Uh, that's like getting, that's like getting dunked with an ice cold bucket of water while you're laying down in bed. Um, yeah, I would love to have been a, a camera on the wall, fly on the wall when Aaron Rodgers saw that. Uh, guys, what do you think? I mean, that, I was shocked. Not only did they take him that early, but he traded up to get him when every team with the, with the remaining picks, nobody was any interested in getting the quarterback. And those guys just rushed out there to get him. So I was shocked. That was probably the shock of the, of the draft. And everybody's been talking about it since, but, uh, Noah, yeah, what do you what you what you make of that uh, Jordan Love Packers Aaron Rodgers? Oh, I'm thrilled. I'm in love with that pick as a Seahawks fan because it is the beginning of major tension in the locker room of Green Bay. You look at this guy Matt Lafleur, right? Where he's been in the past, everywhere he's gone after he leaves, that offense got better. Tennessee. Uh, What happened when he was there? He was a bottom five offense in the league. He was the offensive coordinator. He leaves, goes to Green Bay, Tennessee. Now he's in the AFC championship game. You look at what happened when he was in Green Bay the year before. Aaron Rodgers had a phenomenal or uh, had a better year. The team had a better year, excuse me. And then this past season, the whole team takes a step back and they had a fake record of 13 and three. This was a leverage move by Matt LaFleur in an attempt to, to, basically get Aaron Rodgers to stop complaining as they transition to a run first offense. We saw who they drafted in the second round. They drafted a running back or as the rounds went on, they drafted a running back and a tight end as their next selections because they want to go run first. They want to go run heavy. They're trying to use their personnel in certain ways that Aaron Rodgers isn't going to like. Aaron Rodgers is a diva. There have been reports coming out about him and the problems that he has in the locker rooms for a year. He pushed Mike McCarthy out of town on his massage parlor and he He's constantly having these rifts with former players, and everyone always blames the former players. Packers fans blame the former players. No, it's because of Aaron Rodgers. That's a common denominator here. And now, how do you think he reacted when he found out you traded up to go get a guy in Jordan Love? It's not the same scenario as when Aaron Rodgers got drafted, uh, when Brett Favre was still there. First of all, Favre was talking about retirement. Second of all, Rodgers was supposed to go potentially top five in the NFL draft, and he fell to them, and they were like, okay, well, he's still here. And, you know, our boards are totally blown up because of that. Let's take them. Uh, that's completely different than what happened with Jordan Love. Jordan Love was not a top prospect in the NFL draft. He was not going to go in the top five or even top ten. And then Green Bay trades up to get him. That is a move that creates an extreme rift between Matt LaFleur and Aaron Rodgers. LaFleur is trying to get leverage so that as he as he changes the offense, Rodgers doesn't have as much power because we have another quarterback in your room learning from you right now that we can throw in there. So uh, you don't have as much say. Uh, they can't trade Rodgers within the next two years, so it's going to be an unhappy marriage for at least two more years. Rodgers is already on the decline. By then, he'll be uh, potentially over the cliff so uh it's not a good move for green bay it's a horrible move for rogers and because of that as a seahawks fan i love it <laughs> calvin are you just as much in in, in bliss about this as uh, as noah is i gotta yeah, agree course. with you man that's well put yeah i i can't even i don't even know what else i could add to that i think that uh what the packers are doing it looks like they're trying to sabotage rogers like with Belichick was doing with uh, Tom Brady and the Patriots last couple of years, not providing him with enough help. Uh, It definitely didn't help that they traded up to get Jordan Love. I think that if he fell to them, then maybe the situation wouldn't be as, you know, wouldn't be as controversial. But the fact that they traded up to get him when they could have got him if they stayed, I think that that definitely says something. And they didn't draft a single receiver in any of the rounds in a, in a receiver rich draft. That says, that should say a lot. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to see a, a similar scenario to what we saw with Bill Belichick and Tom Brady. There's going to be a divorce, you know, come in within the next year or two. Um, well, I'm not really going to blame Matt LaFleur and the Packers. I'm starting to see some decline in, in Aaron Rodgers for the last couple of years now. He's still a top 10 quarterback in football, but I don't see how long he's going to be able to, to maintain that, especially going into next year. He still doesn't have a number two receiver. After Devontae Adams, there's no one else for him to throw the ball to. And like you said, no, they're going to be a run, a run based team. And Aaron Rodgers, he's still going to have that that mindset, that mentality that, you know, like I'm still a star quarterback. You know, why are we, you know, uh, transitioning to 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 being such a run heavy football team? He's not going to like that. And so there's going to be a whole lot of drama over there in Green Bay if there isn't already. And uh, yeah, I'm with you. United you know, Seahawks fan, we love to see that. Even before they took Jordan Love, I didn't really see the Packers 
uh, they didn't get any better. And now with all these teams in the NFC getting better, um, Green Bay got worse. And not only did they get worse, now you're adding all all these potential locker room issues. It's not going to look good for Green Bay. You say all that, of course. Aaron Rodgers looked like the man when he played us last year. I don't know what the heck happened in that game. We Again, we should have beaten the Packers, but freaking Devontae Adams had his way uh, with our secondary. Again, the Trey Flowers uh a conundrum that we discussed hopefully has been addressed and if we ever face that same situation again it would be a whole different uh different situation should have won that game as we know and even despite all the bad secondary play the uh the dropped catch by malik turner oh my gosh dude you can't drop that ball first down catch packer territory on the move I mean that 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 was a backbreaker, and I, I think by itself pretty much almost ended the game. If you know, other than the defense not being able to stop Rodgers on the next drive, but um, that's a whole other whole other discussion of, of conversation. Let's keep this going on. Uh, we got uh, Alex in Nebraska, if my memory serves correctly. Alex, is this you? Yep. What's up, man? Hello. What you got? Uh. I was just wondering what you think about our safety position wise. I haven't really, hmm. we haven't really done much in the safety. That's a good point. We haven't talked much about it. Um, uh, yeah, what do you guys think? Um, I I kind of like our, sa- our our safety positions, but obviously it's not really set yet for the long term. But I think we're in a pretty good spot right now if we stay healthy, guys. What's your what's your thoughts about our uh, the secondary as it pertains to the safety side of things? Uh, Noah, you go. Okay, um, so I, I like Quandre Diggs, so I like Bradley McDougal. I think Marquise Blair gets more snaps this year, and I think that's essentially our three. I think those guys are all going to rotate in and out. Marquise Blair is a young guy that we're developing. Bradley McDougal, I don't know how much more time he's going to have in Seattle, uh, but I, I do like him when he plays for us. I, I, I like seeing his physicality, his mentality. Uh, he, he's always a good sound bite, that's for sure. And uh, he, he, he plays with the Seahawks mentality where he's not afraid to put his body on on the line for us we saw him miss a couple of plays last year uh you know wh- what do you expect it's bradley mcdougall he's not cam chancellor he's not earl thomas but marquise blair is a guy that he is the future of our safety group uh and, and then quandre Diggs as well we saw the impact that he had after getting traded during the season well what's going to happen if he has an offseason even if it is a limited one i think quandre Diggs has a big year and you can't forget that they're going to have help of a better uh cornerback in quentin dunbar now so that's more balls getting tipped in the air that they could find their way to intercepting i think our whole defense is better i think our our pass rush is better that's also going to help our secondary so i think our secondary is definitely improved we don't have tedrick thompson to give up big touchdowns for no reason so i think marquise blair quandre Diggs, brother mcdougald they're going to have a much better stat line this year than they did last year and it's uh, partly because of the supporting cast yeah most definitely i'm with you know i think those are our three guys uh we're set at safety and that's why that's probably why we didn't address safety in the draft um i think we signed a few safeties as undrafted free agents but aside from that i like what we have at safety quandre Diggs, he's a star um we saw what you know Noah was talking about we saw his impact in, in such a limited amount of time in seattle's uh system and so uh i can only imagine what he could bring to the table with you know uh, an offseason under his belt uh he was returning picks for touchdowns he was truly impacting games for us uh, winning games for us almost single-handedly and so uh, I was very excited when we traded for him last last year. And at the small cost of a fifth round pick, we got a star safety. Marquise Blair, he should only get better. He's you know going into his second year next year. He's a hard hitter. Um, I can't wait to see him improve. And um, Bradley McDougal, he's a real solid veteran. He's not a superstar by any means, but he's been there for a few years now, and he's provided steady play. And I expect that to continue. Mm. A quick, quick, random question here, and Alex, thank you for the call from Nebraska. If you could take any of these three, one of these three guys back at their prime, who would you take? Richard Sherman, Earl Thomas, or Cam Chancellor? Right now, right now. Uh, no. I would say Cam Chancellor or oh. Calvin. <laughs> Go ahead, Calvin. You got it. I would say Cam Chancellor. Uh, he was a leader of our defense. We had it was a, such a star-studded defense, but he was a captain for a reason. He set the tone. He was everybody feared him. Nobody when they saw the Seahawks on the schedule, teams didn't want to play us because of Cam. Uh, he was just so good at what he did. He instilled a lot of fear. He knocked guys out of games uh, <laughs> at times, and he just he was that leader 
I feel like he was the glue that, that held us together. And so if I had to pick a player, it'd be Cam Chancellor for sure. How about you, Noah? Yeah, there, there's there's hard hits in football, and then there's Chancellor hits in football. He was the enforcer. I'm 100% with you, Calvin. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cam Chancellor puts fear in opponents' eyes. He <laughs> knocked a couple people out of the NFL, practically. Uh, and and he, he just the impact that he has, he won us that Super Bowl early by – scaring Wes Welker and Demarius Thomas and these guys from running underneath. That's an impact that can never be overstated. Uh, as soon as we lost him, our secondary got uh, took a major hit. Cam Chancellor would have to be the first guy that we bring back just because of the tone that he sets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I've, I've been very public about my feelings that Cam, Cam Chancellor is probably my favorite C- modern-day Seahawk for that very reason, just because you just... It's they've almost legislated that kind of hitting out of the game, but he was the kind of guy that when I talk about that too many guys going crossing routes across the the middle, he stopped that from happening. Like nobody wanted any part of going across the middle, and because it was him, they were, they saw what he did. He put it out there like I ain't gonna get my my head you know knocked off doing that. The hell with that. So I I miss that especially because I feel like. You know, even Brandon Browner, while he's the kind of the, that odd ball, odd man out of the LOB, but he had his, he was also kind of that dirty, you know, rough it what? up. You know, he, he he did some kind of nasty hits of his own, not so much power, but just he would get under opponent's skins. But we don't really have, actually, Quandre Diggs has shown up and he's shown he can light some people up. So I'm hoping he'll continue with that. But prior to him, there really wasn't anybody who you felt like was that guy who instilled fear. That you know was going to put some pain into you, you know, uh, uh, on the defensive side of the ball. So Quandre Diggs, hopefully he'll keep doing what he's doing. But maybe one of these guys is uh, is the kind of guy that's going to lay some hits on people and, and, and get a reputation back up and and put Seahawks, Seattle back on the map for a place that you just do not want to uh, run into. Let's go to another line here. Let's go. I think this is Joey here from Washington, but not a Seahawks fan. Joey, is that right? Are you uh, you are not a Seahawks fan, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, correct? No, I'm an Eagles fan. That's what I thought. Uh, it's it's been a while, but uh, how are you? What's I'm on your mind? Resident What's on your Eagles. mind today? Eagles uh, fan in Washington. The draft. How about that? Yeah, the draft. Let's just talk about the draft. How each of our guys' drafts went. Well, let okay. Let me throw it your way, since the Eagles had an interesting scenario where the Eagles had their own quarterback little controversy, uh, picking up. Uh, who did you guys get in the uh, draft? Jalen Hurts. Jalen Hurts. That's Jaylen right. Jalen Hurts. Hurt. Oklahoma. So, as an Eagles Are fan, we? what did you think of that? What does that tell Carson Wentz, or does I that tell Carson it's Wentz a anything? Good pick, because honestly, I think it's a good pick. Carson Wentz, as we've seen for the past like two or three years, he's very injury prone. I think bringing in Jalen Hurts, I think it's a good decision to see who, which of those two could win the starting job. Nate Sutfeld will still be our third stringer or second stringer. Nate okay. Sutfeld isn't going anywhere. He'll still be our backup quarterback. Hmm. So, But I like yeah. the idea of Jalen Hurts coming in and battling Carson for that starting job. To think, I think Jalen Hurts could oh. win that starting job, possibly. Wow. Well, they paid they paid Carson Wentz a lot of money, did they not? Uh, what was the contract that they uh, they did an extension on his contract not that long ago? That's interesting. Quarterback controversy brewing in the Eagles. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, so while you're checking that out, uh, uh, Noah, starting with you, what did what did you make of that uh, that move with the Eagles uh, getting Jalen Hurts? That was a little bit of a surprise as well. For, well, first of all, I am shocked that an Eagles fan wants to come on with some Seahawks fans and talk about how the draft went. Because uh, not only with the Jalen Hurts, hey, thing, honestly, I, I don't love the, a, a I don't love the minus. pick because it's it, it's too early. He he, went, he wasn't going off the board that early. You could have waited, traded back, any of that, and still got him on your roster. I, I I don't think he competes for the starting job. I think he is there as the backup, and that's why I also think you drafted him too early. You don't draft a guy. That that early to come in and be your backup for the foreseeable future, especially after you just paid Carson Wentz the way that you did as according to Norcam. But I also don't 
think that was the worst pick in the draft. I think the worst pick you guys made was in the first round when you passed on Justin Jefferson coming off a year where he had 18 touchdowns and 1,500 yards for a guy in Jalen Rieger who had a third of both of those. Uh, instead of having 18 touchdowns, he had six touchdowns. And instead of 1,500 yards, he had about 500. So I think that is a horrible move. Justin Jefferson got drafted the next uh, the next pick. And, when he made and then, that pick. And then you add that with Jalen Hurts, I gave you guys a D on your draft grade. Uh, all right, so I'm going to let you respond here, uh, Joey. So what do you have to say about that? I guess, uh, Honestly, what did you think of your I own draft? I was shaking my head when we picked Jalen. Honestly, I was shaking my head. I'm, 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 I'm going to take what Noah said and say it was a bad move taking Jalen. Honestly. So you came here to vet. It was a bad move. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, questionable for sure. It was a bad move. <laughs> I don't think Jay, I think Jalen's going to be a bust, honestly. Wait, but didn't you I'm say, say that he's going to I'm going to say job. out of the league in four We're years. You're talking about Rieger. Oh, okay. I'm right, talking about right. Rieger. <laughs> I'm take, okay. talking yeah. about Rieger. I'm saying out of the league in at least four years. Oh, mm. that's bad. That's what? never good. That's never good. Wow. And not, not even not on the team, out of the league. That's really bad. I, I'm gonna say I mean, out of the league. Jermaine Fetty. Jermaine Fetty is still in the league. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, you know, we do. I'm this, glad this, we're this, on the same page. This actually makes things a little more interesting yeah. because we do play the Eagles this year in Philadelphia. If my if my uh, scheduling yeah. outlook here looks correct, we don't know game. when yet. But yeah, we do. You guys host the Seahawks this year, which we have done very well, by the way. Uh, I don't remember the last time we lost in Philadelphia. It's been a long time, knock on wood. But we 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 beat you guys twice yeah. in Philadelphia, which uh, oh, and I, I assume uh, Joey that have you watched that show All or Nothing on Amazon Prime? Uh, no. Oh, dude, you got to watch it. Uh, they did an entire season of All or Nothing. It was basically like hard knocks of the entire season. It's a wonderful show, and uh, if, if you got Amazon Prime, it's free. So go check it out. They've done five seasons now. They started with the. Cardinals, I think. They did Cardinals. They did the Rams. They did the uh, Panthers, Cowboys, Cowboys and then most recently... I think they did the Raiders They did Raiders on Hard Knocks, but no, All or Nothing is basically an NFL films crew that didn't just cover... Hard Knocks just covers the the training camp. This covers the entire season. And what I loved about last year, of course, is that we beat you guys twice last year, so we got a lot of airtime in that All or Nothing show. So uh, you should watch it. It's, it's good, though. I mean, for anybody who's a, a football fan, you got to watch All or Nothing on Amazon Prime. I went back and watched uh, basically the, the different seasons, and it's fun watching the you know the Cowboys. Cause again, Seattle beat them that year in that game that was a must-win for the playoffs. We beat them in Dallas. Uh, there was also, of course, the Cardinals we played twice a year, the Rams we played twice a year. Um, and then uh, the Panthers, we we also played them that year, and and that had that game when Russell threw that uh, uh, touchdown on fourth down to to basically seal that game or nearly seal the game, but it led to a big part of why we won that yeah. game. So anyway, yeah. Seahawks fan or not, that's a, it's a great show to watch, and one day I'm hoping that they do a, yeah. a, a coverage on us. But so the Eagles, uh, so, so I guess just wrap up your call by telling me what's your what's your feeling now? Not the best draft in the world. What's your feeling moving forward? Uh, in the 2020 season? Mm, I'm going to say, prediction-wise, I'm going to say we finish 10-6. and six, And I'm going to say we're going to be the four seed. Because the NFC East is still... I haven't looked over the Giants, Cowboys, or Redskins draft picks, other than the second overall pick, where Redskins obviously got Chase Young. But mm-hmm. I haven't looked over their picks, so... Right now, Eagles, I'm standing at 10-6, and six, but I'm going to say the NFC East is still going to be a crap shot, and it's still going to be a garbage division. Who do you think wins Dallas the East? Dallas had a phenomenal draft. Dallas, I got an A for their draft. They added mm-hmm. C.D. Lamb, who had an outstanding yeah. season uh, at Oklahoma. Yeah. They added Neville Gallimore and Trayvon Diggs, two more mm-hmm. needs that they had. So that that's going to be a really – like they had three uh, potential yeah. first-round draft picks in the first three rounds of their draft. Precisely. Yeah, they did. They got some weapons. So who do you think, who do you think wins the NFC Honestly, East? when I was watching the draft – the first pick you guys got, I think it was a Jordan. Who was Brooks. it? Jordan Brooks, linebacker. Jordan, yeah, Jordan Brooks. That pick had me shaking my head for you guys. Like, oh, uh, why did you guys choose him? 
We were all kind of shaking our heads. Your, your linebacking yeah. core looks amazing. You're not wrong. It, it, it is a little aged, well, I'll say, though. You guys, have, you guys still have one of the best secondaries in the in the league, or Ooh. middle middle of the field. Um, Sorry. Which, were you only watching one half of the field? <laughs> <laughs> we had a very suspect right side of our uh, defensive secondary, which they have addressed now that we got uh, somebody out of the NFC East and Quentin Dunbar. So, uh, so I'm just curious, as, a, yeah. as an Eagles fan then, who wins the NFC East this year? You're not, it's not uh, going to be the Eagles at 10-6. and six. Are you saying it's going to be Dallas? Dallas a, to, seems to be the front yeah, runner. I... I've never sworn on Dallas. I never. I hate them. I hate them with a burning passion. You're kind of saying I'm either it, say the giant. I'm gonna either say the Dallas or the Skins. Skins maybe. Skins, Skins have the next best shot. It's hard to argue that Dallas is not going to take it. Cowboys or Eagles first, and Redskins second. I'm gonna say Giants third or fourth. Okay. That sounds about right. It sounds about I, typical for the NFC East. Draft, I have the Giants at seven and nine. Mm. Oh, that's a little generous. And depending on yeah, how the pretty... NFC East goes, that could either get you a third spot or a fourth <laughs> spot. Well, they do have the expanded playoffs now, so, so some other team who doesn't deserve to be there is going to be there, and maybe it will be one of those uh, bottom <laughs> yeah. feeders in the NFC East. Uh, we'll we'll yeah. see. But all right, well, interesting. That's that's good that you actually admitted that you know wasn't the best draft it in the world for you guys. I, if there are teams I hate with a burning passion, Dallas is one of them. Redskins. Of and as of now, I'm going to keep my eyes on the Bucks. Oh, everybody's going to be watching the Bucks, Bucks this, do this year. season after they picked up Tommy Boy. And Gronk. They're, they're, that's going to be much. We're going, to, we're going to be watching that whether we like it or not. You know the NFL is going to be milking that sucker. <laughs> we're, going be, we're going to be seeing more Buccaneers highlights this year than we've seen in the last ten years. Uh, the way it's going to go, <laughs> yeah. even if they're good or bad. Uh, but it will be fascinating yeah. TV just to watch Tom Brady in this strange colored outfit that has no blue in it. So it'll be um, yeah. it'll, it'll be a fun season, uh, assuming we have a season. We'll have some kind of season. It's just going to be some yeah. something different than what we're used to. But. Doggone it, I better be in that stadium, man, because I got my seats upgraded. They lowered the price for me. I'm like, it's a win, win, win. All of a sudden, if we don't play, it's going to be the biggest letdown of all of my Seahawks tickets history. So, anyway, it's good to have you on. Appreciate your, your, your feedback, and we, will, we should connect again closer to, uh, to the time we play uh, so we can trash talk, I mean, yeah. uh, collaborate a little bit on uh, you know, what's going to happen <laughs> when we play each other. All right, Joey, yeah. thanks for the call. Appreciate well, it, man. Love you, all right, you got it. All right, let's go a couple more here. Um, let's say, uh, let's see, it's almost five. It's, we've been going for almost two hours, so we'll probably call it at about the two-hour mark, which is in just a few more minutes. So let's get a couple more calls here, and then we'll wrap things up. Uh, let's go to the 417. Uh, you guys still cool with that, Noah and Calvin? You guys still good? Of course. Oh, this is fun. This Noah, is your, fun. your dog doesn't need your attention. Calvin, you don't have any uh, work to do anywhere, somewhere? No, 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 no iron to pump? You're good? <laughs> no, right now. You could do some workouts in front of us and give us some, you know, tips. But uh, for now, let's let's go on into the the end of the fourth quarter here. Let's go to one, another call from the four one seven. Yo, what's up? This is Norb Cam. Hey, You're Norb. live with Noah and Calvin. Who's this? This is Gibby. Uh, what's the name? Gibby. Gibby. Gibby, like G I B B Y. Yeah. Gibby. All right. And where are you calling from? Mundo. From where? Uh, Missouri. Oh, Gibby from Missouri. Okay, and are you a Seahawks fan? I am not. I'm not okay. actually. I'm a. I'm a Niner fan, but no, no hate, no hate. I, I'm respectable. I'm in your house. I'll, I'll show you all the respect in the world. Oh, that's actually, okay. It's, it's, uh, it's actually more exciting when there's a lot more trash talking going on. So I'm okay with that. But who are you a fan of? Then? <laughs> I'm a fan of the Niners. Um, oh, but, uh, but like let I, me make a I, note I here. Um, okay. <laughs> Get him off. Uh, get him off. Uh, I got to put a big red mark by your name here. Okay. <laughs> all right. So we got another. Fo- this is all right. So new 49er fan. There, there, I have the really. Uh, there's a real uh, trash talking 49er fan, uh, and that's Triple G Mono. And then we've got the most passive 49er fan in existence, and that's Rohan. Where do you? Where do you land in there? Okay. Are you somewhere between passive um, and aggressive? I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let you decide. I guess. Um, okay. Talk to me. I don't think I can. <laughs> well, uh, I just 
for Noah, I want to correct him a little bit. Uh, oh. We play the NFC East and the AFC East, by the way. So to get on it, okay. um, I'll, I'll do a little trash talking. But uh, <laughs> let's hear it. Uh, no, actually, to kind of go and answer your question from earlier about what does Garoppolo bring, or or how do how can I explain to feel confident in, in Garoppolo? And, um, Just come you know, to the with, rescue, with coming the to the that, rescue of Jimmy Garoppolo. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I love uh, it. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's hear it. I, I, I'll admit he's not elite. I'm not going to be Stan. All of it is not a week. Um, but I'll also okay. say he's We're not a game manager because I think people have forgotten what game manager means. Um, if we look back at when it got started, obviously it was with Alex Smith. Alex Smith really didn't bring a whole lot uh, of big play potential, but he didn't make a lot of mistakes. And so that's where everybody was calling him uh, a game manager. Jimmy makes mistakes, but he'll also make the big plays. So he's a little bit more of a gunslinger, uh, but he's just been not not your same kind of gunsling like you would think of Brett Favre as as one, but uh, as far as the, me feeling good about him moving forward ne- uh, into the next season, uh, I just look at some of the past quarterbacks that Shanahan has had in their second season with him and how their stats have gone up um, pretty pretty noticeably. And then also he's coming off of an ACL injury, and it, you know looking at a bunch of other quarterbacks who had an ACL play the next season, they always had pretty rudimentary numbers, you know effect on velocity, things like that. So I think he'll have an increase there having a proper off season where he's not rehabbing, he can spend more time with the receivers, things like that, develop a little bit better chemistry. Um, also, one of the things that we focused on was our wide receiver core and getting more uh, tough in those guys. So we got the Brandon IU guy who actually, um, he used to play running back a lot like the same with Debo. Uh, so he's not the same kind of just scrawny guys that we've been getting where uh, your freaking DVs just push around because for whatever reason <laughs> we can't push back. Uh, so we got that guy, uh, John Jennings, he's a dog. Uh, Jalen Hurd will be coming in, and, you know, he used to be running back. So we're getting a little bit more, I guess you'd say, just more dogs on the wide receiver end of things. So, um, And if any of them are even close to what Debo did, we'll, we'll be okay there. I think Jimmy, for the most part, fits what Kyle is trying to build the offense to be. He's just got a quick release. We're just all, all we're really focused on is trying to get the ball out quick and let wide receivers make plays, you know, be the running back, be these return guys uh, at the wide receiver position. Okay, give me, so, so I'm going to stop you catch. for a second. This is not trash talking. Okay. This is too much of a logical analysis that's waking made way too much sense. Hey. Let okay. me stir the, let uh, me stir uh, the pot uh, a little bit. Let me st- little bit? Wait, wait, so let me just stir the pot a little bit. So, yes, Jimmy G is a gunslinger. Okay. He's a gunslinger with bad aim. Okay, so that's how I would categorize <laughs> the gunslinger aspect. And then Kyle Shanahan's system is, I think, you show up for three quarters and forget what you're doing in the fourth quarter, like abandoning the run that's working so well for you, and then putting your quarterback in a spot where he has no nothing he can do except have to make a heroic big play, which clearly he has let not me, demonstrated uh, the ability to do. Before you go too far. All right, there. I just try to get. I'm trying to spice up uh, the soup a little bit because you're way too like logical. Okay. Come on, bring in the emotion, All baby. Right. All right. So, so you see, he's in, he's inaccurate. Yeah, he got about seventy percent completion percentage, which was top five in the league. Um, but if you want to look at it. When he's under pressure, he was actually second best in the league in accuracy at 48%, compared to your guy who was 20th in the league at 35%. I'm just saying. <laughs> now, when you never rush the ball, okay. he does great when there's a clean pocket. You guys love running your max protections for the first half. It doesn't get you any points, but you love running it. Um, and then you'll, you'll, uh, once you wear down a defense a little bit, then you'll start scoring some points because you'll let Russ actually do his thing. <laughs> so I, I don't I don't think you should uh, help your Jimmy G argument by comparing him to Russell Wilson. I just don't, like, for your sake, I don't think that's a good place to go. <laughs> what I will say is about uh, your guys' roster. So here's the big mistake going on. Just, just level with me for a second. With everything going on in Dallas right now, should they pay Dak Prescott? Well, mm. now you look at Dallas and you see, okay, now he has Amari Cooper, Michael Gallup, CD lamb, and all pro running back, a great offensive line, a good defense. Why would you want to pay him now when now everyone else is going to be the reason that you're winning? If he can't make you the winner that, that you need to be, why are you paying him top dollar like somebody who should? That's the same problem we're having with Jimmy G. When the whole supporting cast, one of the best defenses in the NFL, extremely talented wide receiver core, three great running backs, one of them's the 98 in Madden for no reason at all, and then an offensive line that's extremely physical, along with a great head coach and Kyle Shanahan, 
who's getting the ball out of Jimmy G's hands because he doesn't like his decision making. Uh, and you still oh, on, can't get the plays on, done so, when it matters so the most down he, the stretch in close games. Jimmy G is not the guy that can make you guys. But he's also abandoning the run. How does that work? So, I'm sorry. Start. So how is he taking the ball out of Jimmy G's hands but also abandoning the run? How does that work? Uh, no, no, no. I, I'm saying he's trying to get the ball out of his hands as quick as possible by giving him quick reads because the longer he has the ball in his hands, the more risk it's in. Well, that's true. Uh, but we also uh, feature an outside zone scheme. We're not, a, you know, we're not getting these big beefy offensive linemen who are known for being pass blockers. We're getting these guys for more run blocking guys. And then we're just moving the pocket, essentially. That's kind of how the, the scheme works. So it's not something that's designed to be where you put a quarterback in a bucket for, you know, three, four, five seconds. It's very 90s style, like Mike Shanahan had with the Broncos uh, in that regard. Uh, so it's, it's really just kind of going back to what offenses used to do, I guess, with getting more teams that are trying to get smaller and be able to be in pass coverage. Why not just get quick passes to these, you know, wide receivers that are known for breaking tackles. So, Gibby, let me ask you something. Why not adjust to what defense they're doing? Hey, Gibby, so tell me something. How do you answer, why did the 49ers lose the Super Bowl to the Kansas City Chiefs? I'm just, no, I'm not, I'm not even, I'm not even I trash mean, talking. I just want to know, as a fan, we all have to find our, our breakdown as to why did it not happen. Every team that didn't win at all, you have to go and say, well, this is why we lost. Why did the 49ers lose, in your opinion? Same re- I mean, uh, I mean, it's probably the same answer you would give for uh, why you guys lost the Super Bowl. Um, we had, the, you know, probably some bad decision making. We can also say um, when you look at the fourth quarter, Jimmy G took that shot to the head, and that's also that's whenever he started having really bad numbers. He was 18 of 22 before the fourth quarter, and then went three for 11 in the fourth quarter after he took that hit. So you know, he got this definitely was just knocked out of his game. He was a beat late. A lot of our plays definitely require being on time. He's not Russell Wilson where, or Kyler Murray or any of these mobile quarterbacks where he can you know make plays with his legs. So a lot of what he does does require being on timing. So once he got knocked out of that, I, I think he just struggled with recovering. Uh, he started getting jittery. You know, just it, it's his first season as a starter. I don't really put too much on him for for losing it, but I do I do put him. Uh, as one of the main reasons for losing the Super Bowl. You know, I hadn't heard that injury reason as, as, as given to me as one of the reasons they lost. I actually didn't even factor that in. That's new. That's a new uh, excuse or reason for that, actually. But what I do want to what I do want to ask you, though, there's Kyle, Kyle, Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan has shown a history of blowing leads. He did that when he was coordinator in at, at, at Atlanta. Uh, with, the, with the most historic blown lead in the Super Bowl. And then he had a 10-point lead on the Chiefs going into the fourth quarter, if I'm not mistaken, right? How much blame mm-hmm. do you put on the play calling? Since Kyle Shanahan, he calls the offense, right? He's the offensive guru there. Uh, yeah, how much do you blame much on, him for on that? Kyle because, because looking back at, the, at those plays, we had guys open. We just weren't hitting them. But also, mad props to Chris Jones. That guy freaking took over the game and was making plays. He had three batted passes uh, and was just an absolute monster. So I give a lot of props to the Chiefs defense there. I mean, they made more plays than we did. They won the Super Bowl, so I'm not going to take anything away from them. But but don't you uh, think if they stuck Shanahan with there, if, if they'd stuck with the run though, they wouldn't have had those batted passes. I the, it's just this is the thing is you, the 49ers' strength well, all we postseason was all running the ball. Lead. Why would they go away from that, especially when they had a 10 point lead? Because we weren't, we weren't running five. effectively. We were in third and seven situations, third and eight situations. We had two drives where we uh, had guys jump off sides. So you're not really going to uh, run the ball when you're in third and eight, you know. Well, uh, yeah, so and that, really, that particular really case a, is true. An abandoning but, of the run. But also we had, uh, we had a play where George Kittle was lined up uh, uh, right off the tight end spot, hand in the dirt, and he was being covered by Frank Clark. And so we had a great mismatch there. So it's just, you know, we were playing the mismatches. But again, on that play, Kittle got open and Chris Jones batted the ball down. So it was just I they made that play. plays. We we were trying to play an advantage, and uh, you know they they were a step ahead. Well, uh, I, I don't think that was a bad play call. I just think it was just a you know Chris Jones making a play. Yeah, I agree. That was a play that it looked like it was going to happen, and he just got his hand put up in the right spot. Which I hope Seahawks linemen are paying attention because doggone it, 
if you can't get to the quarterback, put your hands up and at least try to knock that ball down because that's as good as uh, that's as good as any you know uh, as anything you can do on that's, a play. Yeah. You know, because if you that's can't get pressure, my, you can still do something. My defensive line with you. <laughs> as good yeah. as my defensive line is, we have we only had like two battered balls last year. So to see one guy do it twice in one quarter was just so frustrating. Well, but you guys, uh, if, if, if a team, if, if anyone's got a team where you don't need to complain about your defensive line, uh, I think the 49ers have been sitting pretty with a pretty <laughs> doggone good 40, uh, defensive line right there. You're probably the envy of most defensive yeah. lines, especially uh, led by Joey Bosa, who you guys just struck gold with him. And uh, you guys, Nick. you know, drafted well to supplement what you lost there. And so I'm not looking, you know, I'll admit, I'm not looking forward to, to facing that line. I'm hoping our, our offensive line replaces placements here, particularly at center and uh, and at right guard, are going to be able to uh, stop that onslaught because uh, you guys do have a badass oh. uh, defensive line. That, that does I'm remind me of something else that you guys brought up earlier. I'm really glad you didn't draft Cesar Ruiz either. <laughs> yeah, guy's that a one did there was a lot of names we could have seen go. That was one of many that we were all going, oh, maybe they'll get this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. I think we would have gone through 30 names before we would have landed on Jordan Brooks, but hey. They're the experts. We're just a bunch of guys who, who like to watch football. So what do we know? But, yeah. Yeah. Talk trash. But, uh, well, hey, man. I'll uh, get to another caller. I won't take up too much yeah. of your time. Hey, I, I will say, as much as all the trash talking and stuff, you are one of the more sane guys. You are definitely in the middle of the Rohan pass a, a passive dude and triple g who's like insanely doesn't listen to anything except his own breath so you're actually a pretty uh, yeah, nice I normal guy in the middle so it's nice to have three flavors of neapolitan 49er fans we got the chocolate we've got you <laughs> vanilla in the middle and we've got some strawberry crazy head over here on this side so it's it's good to have a good mix i, I appreciate hearing from you man and i'm sure we'll talk hey, more during this season. i look forward to your yeah, I look forward to your next parody video. Your your Christophimo guy is freaking oh, hilarious. There will definitely there will definitely be more of that. I got to ask you. So, as a 49er fan li- living in Missouri, how did you end up becoming a follower or viewer well, of my I, channel? I was actually born in California. Yeah, I was actually oh, born so in California. Oh, so you're a 49er but, fan uh, by by geography, and then moved to to Missouri. Right. Yeah, I, I was in San Francisco. Uh, okay. I got to meet Jerry Rice, Steve Young, uh, wow. Deion Sanders in that '94 year uh, That's cool. when we won that. Super Bowl, and then uh, we moved out in '95, and that was that was it. And when did when did you start watching my videos? Uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, I think, is when I started watching your videos. Oh, very cool. I never started getting into your live streams until about I want to say halfway <laughs> through last season. I didn't even know you were doing them, and then uh, I finally got notifications, and I was like, oh heck, <laughs> it's oh, fun to hear. Oh, so, oh, so you were watching yeah. other videos, not the games. You just got into those recently. So what was? do you remember the first video that actually caught your attention that made you go, I'm a 49er uh-huh. fan. I think I'm going to watch this goofy Seahawks fan for some reason. Um, do you remember what caught your attention? Season, I was watching a lot of content creators uh, around that time, and <clears> I saw you had a ton of subscribers. And I'm like, all right, this is the, uh, this is the official guy to go to <laughs> all right, for, uh, well. for Seahawks stuff. Well, and I do involve the 49ers quite a bit in my stuff, so I'm sure that that makes it somewhat more interesting <laughs> on your on your side of things. So, well, I appreciate you watching I, it. And, I don't know and, how you wear, I don't know how you wear another team's gear, but good on you, I guess. Hey, man, sometimes you got to take one for the team. If it's t- for the betterment of the team <laughs> and your own fan bases, I will make the sacrifice. Glad to make All the right. sacrifice. Well, hey, appreciate your content. Uh, All right, well, thank you, man. Appreciate it. All right, thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, nice we to meet take- you. Yeah, we'll take Take one more call, and this is Lewis. He's no no stranger to the program. Uh, Lewis Leibowitz, what's up? Hello? Lewis. Hello? Lewis, you're on. You're on live TV. Yes, what's up? Everything's good, actually. How are you? I'm I'm doing great. We're doing great. We're about to wrap up the show. You're the last caller, so uh, the floor is yours. What's on your mind, bro? Make it good, because you're the finale. Um, <laughs> um, no so pressure. Stuff after, actually. <laughs> what? Hello? Speak up. <laughs> what do you hear? Uh, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of scheduling, actually, with the schedule. Okay. What about it? It's on my mind. Oh, okay. What about, um, it, what about it is on your mind? Yeah. Because it's a lot of potential things changing with the schedule. But I guess maybe I'll throw the question your way. Are you... Do you think there will be a season this year? Or is that what you're talking about? Like, are we going to play games, or are you talking about the actual Seahawks schedule coming up in 2020? 
Um, yeah, I think it actually will be a season. The question is, when will it start? Um, mm-hmm. I actually agree with a lot of what you're saying. I think mostly, probably a month at the minimum, maybe. But I'm thinking a month they maybe push back. So a season that st- starts in October, essentially, is kind of what uh, what you think is going to happen. Well, let's okay. Let's assume yeah. that happens and that we will have some form of a of a of a, a football season. Uh, what is the most intriguing game? And I guess I'll, I'll throw this to all you guys as kind of our final point of discussion. So in 2020, we play obviously our division op- opponents, and then a few sprinkled in uh, of, from other divisions. But primarily, we play you know all the teams from the AFC East this year, which of course includes the New England Patriots, the New York Jets, the Baltimore, or Baltimore, the Buffalo Bills, and the uh, who am I missing? Who did I miss? Miami Dolphins. Did I see that? Dolphins. Yeah. So, um, and then on top of that, we also have a few mixed in, such as the aforementioned Philadelphia Eagles, the Dallas Cowboys. And the New York Giants and the Vikings and the Redskins. We're kind of doing the the, the two East uh, divisions. Which team? And Atlanta is, is is sprinkled in there as well. Uh, do you guys have sort of a team that's sort of your I don't know most intriguing matchup this year outside of the NFC? Let's leave the NFC West out of it because we know we're going to face them and we we know what they're all about. But which 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 uh, game intrigues you the most of all the teams that we're going to play this year? Uh, starting with. Uh, well, let's go with you, Lewis, and I'll turn to my to my boys here. So, Lewis, w- what about you? What what game are you most looking forward to watching on the schedule this year of a non NFC West Seahawks opponent? Okay, um, probably the Dolphins. I gotta say that the Dolphins. Um, then to see how the team looks. The Dolphins had a lot of early draft picks. You know, when you suck, that's kind of the benefit. So they got quite a bit of they, – they cleared, they cleared the cupboards and got a lot of uh, – definitely their names were busy uh, in that first round of the draft this year. Um, a lot of changes there. But, um, yeah, Miami Dolphins. Um, and we will be playing in Miami, so that, that'll that be fun to see. That's a good question. I, I don't really have a good semblance of what this team's going to look like. A lot of new faces on there. Um, I like our chances, I'll say at this point, but uh, I don't really know what we're go- going up against. Guys, uh, I'm going to turn to you. Noah, what's your thoughts on uh, Seahawks-Dolphins? Uh, <clears throat> Hawks going to get it done. Uh, veteran head coach, veteran quarterback compared to a rather new head coach and a rookie quarterback. That's that's the biggest difference that I see between these franchises. Uh, uh, Seattle's a perennial winning franchise the dolphins are not and because of that i think seattle is going to be able to execute when it matters the most i do think it'll be a good game i think it'll be very interesting i like where the dolphins drafted they got a corner they got a, a offensive line they got quarterback obviously they have some talent uh and then they traded for a running back i i, I really think that uh seattle gets it done though in that matchup and uh well, is it is this? Are you doubling this up? Is also like, what's the matchup we're looking at, or is this just about the Dolphins? Because I, I think Seattle wins that matchup. Oh yeah, no, I uh, definitely not sticking with just that. I'd say let's uh, tell me what you think is your interesting uh, or most looking forward to matchup in 2020. You know, uh, it's very interesting that you actually added this to the the rundown for today because we're talking about it on this week's show as well. Oh. And so the matchup that I have circled is, it's going to sound basic, but Hawks Niners. I cannot wait. I love this every single year. It's fun to watch the rivalry. <clears throat> we hate each other. Both teams are stati- uh, padded up. Both teams feel like they could win both games had they not had certain circumstances that direly affected the game, like a missed kick or injuries, you know? Like, it's so close every single year we hate each other Seahawks Niners that's what I cannot wait to see <clears throat> uh, Calvin how about you uh, and uh, hopefully it's not the same teams that we've heard so far maybe pick something out of the NFC West if it wasn't going to be already a team out of the NFC West give me something different since we always face those new crops of uh, unique opponents that we don't face every year gotcha uh, I was going to roll with the Buffalo Bills Hmm. Just because Buffalo, I feel like they're a team on the rise. We, uh, they made it to the playoffs last year. They did uh, lose to the Texans, but they gave Josh Allen a number one wideout in Stephon Diggs. They've long had you know, a top five, top ten defense in football. I expect Josh Allen to take another step in year three. And so I can't wait to see uh, to see us play Buffalo. I, I feel like Buffalo, they're definitely in the upper echelon of teams in the AFC. And so I feel like um, that would be a great game. 
And I feel like we matched up well with Buffalo. They're, you know, a team that relies on the run. Um, and they have a mobile quarterback in Josh Allen. They have a stout defense, well coached. Um, and I can't wait to see how Stephon Diggs uh, fits in with, with the Bills. Uh, like I said, they're a team on the rise, and I feel like they're going to be a great test for us. And so I'm, I'm looking very forward to that matchup with the Buffalo Bills next, week, next season. We've, we've historically, at least recently, have done very well against the Bills. We haven't played them much, but I think both times that we have played them, uh, we've come away with wins, uh, both away and home. Uh, I think for me, I, I, it's, it's hard not to resist the temptation to say re- rematch with the Patriots is always going to be sexy and exciting. It's not going to be as sexy as it would have been if... Um, Tom Brady, Brady were still on the team. Uh, as we know, if you actually look back at the history, we've we've done better in our total matchups in terms of number of wins and losses, because I believe it goes back to we, we won here in Seattle, we lost the Super Bowl, but then we beat them in in uh, in, New in, in New England and in a very exciting game that came down to the one-yard line of all uh, uh, games. Unfortunately, it just didn't have the weight of the Super Bowl, but it was definitely a, a feeling of getting something back, a little bit of revenge. So... This being the fourth game of this, uh, of kind of our history of playing over the past, you know, eight years or so, uh, it'll be fun to see how that game turns out. It's just to see the Patriots in our stadium is just something you don't see very often, and so I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to see that game in person, um, and hopefully we come away with a win and feel like, well, in the past decade we've basically gone three and one over the Patriots. That'd be a nice sort of bragging thing to uh, be able to to uh, hang on to if that's uh, the case, but. That would be my uh, that would be my wish, uh, I guess, for the, the the game that I'm I'm looking forward to. Just not not as quite what it was. I always wanted that rematch with the Patriots in the Super Bowl. I just wish we could have gotten there and faced Tom Brady and had you know like with Richard Sherman still on the team and the LOB. I always felt they they needed a redo on that. They needed a a, a part two to get a, a shot at uh, at the title. But <clears throat> unfortunately, it's not going to ever happen. Not the way we would have loved to it have happened so this will be a close second anyway so i'm looking forward to that seahawks patriots matchup so that's it we actually got through all the calls so i'm really excited about that that was a lot of fun you guys were, were great on the phone glad we could get to to all of you at least i think i got to everybody and um this was great we went for two hours it's a pretty solid two hours i did not expect to go this long but i i uh i think we covered some great stuff and had some fun with 49er fan and eagles fan that i did not expect but actually i think that was actually part of the best part of the uh part of the day talk a little trash talking you know with some of the, the uh, <laughs> rival fans who we'll be playing uh this year so um yeah that's it so we'll, we'll wrap up by just saying thank you for all of you guys who called in Thank you to all of you guys who are still in the chat blowing up. Uh, hopefully we got to answer some of your questions that you had there. Uh, and special thanks to my guests, Calvin Domingo at Steezy Way, and of course Noah Bolter at DJ Squabo. Again, you can your, their, uh, their social uh, handles are on the screen, and you can also find their YouTube channels as well in the description. Go check out their content. They're up and coming. Uh, great analysts uh, and, and uh speakers of all things sports so check out their show and of course tell everybody where they can find your your uh, saturday radio show as well no i'll let yeah, you so pitch that we talk sports from 10 to 1 pacific standard time every single saturday you can tune in live with the kgrg app anywhere or we post it on soundcloud as well just look up the bolt it's t-h-e-b-o-e-l-t we post all the podcasts from the show in case you're unavailable from 10 to 1 on saturday all right, so go check these guys out. But uh, I want to thank both of you, Noah and Calvin. You guys bring great stuff, and it's always a pleasure to have you guys on the show. So thanks for coming on and joining me and talking about Seahawks football. Thank you. Always. All right. And for everybody else watching this now, please uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe to their channels. But, of course, please subscribe to mine. Hit that uh, <laughs> notification bell. Like this video. And uh, hopefully we'll catch you on another one. Uh, we'll definitely be continuing to, t- to talk about this and all things uh, football and Seahawks related as this, the off season in this very strange time that we live in now continue on uh, over the next few months. I'm Norb Kelwheely. Thank you for joining, and we will talk to you all later. Stay safe. Go Hawks.